right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of To the Fullest with Jason Frober. Today we have Dominic Musio from Wicked Garden. How you doing, Dominic? I am well, and I appreciate you having me, man. I'm just, uh, excited about this, actually. It should be good. Oh, man, Sorry. I'm looking forward to it, brother. I really appreciate you coming on the show and, yeah. uh, and hanging out with us today. What you been doing? <laughs> like what everybody else is doing, yeah. sitting at home going fucking stir crazy and just losing my mind. Actually. Driving the family nuts at the house. Pretty and, much. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, I'm I'm the kid of the house. It's like because I got two children that are 18 and almost 20. And then my fiance is like 30 and then we're almost 30. God, she'll kill me for saying that. And then there's me. <laughs> like I'll be 45 tomorrow and I'm like an eight year old. I'm bouncing yeah. off the walls. I'm bothering everybody, you know, and they're just like, well, you've just fucking go in the other room. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, it's awful. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah, we've been uh, we've been driving each other nuts here in the beginning of the uh, virus, but I think now we're we're kicking butt. You, you know, got, well, we, you, yeah, you like a rolling machine. And I came in, it was like, okay, the water's here. There's the couch. Sit down, take this picture. There's the bathroom. I was ready to go, so we were good. Right? Yeah, yeah we're happy about it. We're learning, you yeah. know. <laughs> I think this is, uh, I believe, the tenth episode that we're doing. So nice. uh, yeah, on uh, episode number ten, we kind of have a system together. That's good know, because, like, if I was out. like one of the first guests, it, you would have stopped. <laughs> you would be like, yeah, this isn't worth it. <laughs> Yeah, no, the first uh, first few guests were just, you know, very close friends of mine, and mm-hmm. they, they killed it, you know, they came over and dealt with all my technical difficulties, and like, right. I mean, even my, my very good friend Melissa, I've known since we were 10 years old, uh-huh. um, and she came over, and, and I was like, fuck, we gotta go to Fry's, we gotta go buy some new equipment, <laughs> like, all this is funny, she went to Fry's with me, and oh, got, wow. some, got some gear, and, you know, hung out while we installed it, you know, right. had some food, and and, you know, she was real patient with me and getting everything together. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Melissa. You're yeah, awesome. no, that's right. I wouldn't have that kind of patience for anybody. Yeah. Because <laughs> I said, I'm too ADD. You'd be like, I'm going to Fry's. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be a guitar center. Come get me when you're done. You know, like. Oh, yeah, exactly. I would just lose my shit. Yeah. Yeah, it was just like, yeah, you don't expect, uh, you definitely don't expect your regular guests if I could come with you to Fry's. No. So, yeah, those first few were, you know, the first three were real rough, man. Right. Like, it, it took a second to get off the ground. Mm-hmm. And then we kind of started getting our pace, and now we're really starting to get comfortable with it. You know, I still make yeah. mistakes. Um, but every time I make mistakes, we make note of it, and yeah. Uh, and yeah, we move forward. I think it's good when you make mistakes, I and mean, if you leave yeah. it in there, it's like even with, yeah. you know, like we're recording music and stuff. Like I've had people say to me, like on like on our records, like oh, I heard you know, uh, you know, the guitar went out of tune. They're like, yeah, we know, we left it because it sounded real. Yeah, it's like that's rock and roll. It's like this is rock and roll right here. If if something goes wrong, fuck it, keep going. We'll fix it later. Fix that's it in the mix. It. <laughs> yeah, we just run with it, yeah. you know, and uh, and it's just it's uh, the the learning process, the growing process, and it's a lot of fun. Right. I like that. Like, um, uh, what's my? F- I don't know if you uh, watch anime or not. Uh, I've seen some of it. Some my anime, son, yeah. yeah, he likes it a lot. I won't, I won't dwell on it too much, but there's one called Big O, and in the anime, there's a robot that's it, and the, it's trying to. It, it, well, it's very good at playing piano because it's a fucking robot, right? right? But uh, it, it practices making the mistakes oh, so right. that its playing has that, that human tone where right. it's, it's, it's going ahead or behind the, cool. uh, the rhythm of the uh, metronome. Oh, that's really cool. See, if they, once they learn, they teach computers how to do that, we're all fucked. Yeah. You know, we're screwed. But that's really the important part of it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. That's, it's not just like a repetition of the, the notes and perfection, but it's right. like that... that, that uh, stagnation. Well, I don't know what you just call it. But that's that's where the that's where the groove comes from. Yeah, that's where that feel comes from. That's where all know? the soul is. Absolutely, it's like, you know, if you, like you know, metronomes are great, but like if if you're at one ten and then you go to one twelve just for free measures, that mm-hmm. you could feel that. Yeah, that's like oh yeah, you know, it's like flipping somebody over in the middle of. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, sometimes you got to change it up a little bit. You, you get know? the fucking band driving, right? Yeah, you exactly. Know? You know, a... slow it down. I mean, like, there's some. Uh, did you ever watch like Rick Beato on uh, YouTube? No. Rick Beato's awesome, man. So Rick Beato's a he's a musician and a producer, and he does this uh, he does this series called What Makes the Song Great, and he has all the stems, you know, from the recording, and he breaks shit down and stuff you didn't even hear, and he made a point of. Um, uh, Man in the Box by Alice in Chains. He mm-hmm. said from the first verse to the second verse, they are like literally five beats per minute off. He goes, and that's awesome because it just proved that they were playing live. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. That's that. That's missing in rock. It's missing in life at this point. Yeah, yeah I agree, man. I uh, I got I got deep into doing uh, MIDI controlled drums mm-hmm. and digital drums in the studio. Superior drummer. I had a lot of fun with it. It sounds really good and clean. Yeah. But the uh, the biggest issue we would run into is whenever we would try to make everything perfect. Right. And everything is right on the fucking click. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's uh, 
it was like perfection, right? Yeah. And uh, it, it just doesn't feel right. No, you know, you play it back and you're just like, ugh. I yeah, mean, yeah, that's soul. fucking that's fast and it's metal, but it's like, yeah, it's the it's the flaws that really make it special. Absolutely. I rather I rather I rather listen to a group of guys suck, you know. Yeah. Then listen to like you know Dragon Force, and that's nothing against Dragon Force. Like, they're all amazing musicians, but it's yeah. perfect every single time. Oh yeah. I don't want to hear perfection. You know, I want to hear you know Keith Richards fucking finger getting stuck in the G string and just screwing up the solo at the end of you know uh, of uh, you know you can't always get what you want. Like like I've seen a couple times that he's done. It's just like you know like that. I live for that. Like when I go to see like a live band, somebody screws up and you can see it in their face. Yeah. And what do they do afterwards? If they just keep going, you're like, all right, I give the guy respect because I know I've done it. Yeah, you I, have every to single do it. show, I have fucked something up real bad. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I've never walked on a stage never. and played perfectly. Yeah, no. not one time in my life. I don't. I don't think anybody does. No, they can't. You know? No. Even like, as a matter of fact, you know, and I, I like, I remember Billy Sheehan walking off the stage, right. and uh, and we'd fucking always be chatting about bass stuff. And he would just, he'd just be like, you know, I, I started really feeling it at a certain point, you know, but he was showing me his fingers are all fucked up, and right. I messed it, I messed this part up, and I messed this part, you know, and it's like, you're Billy Sheen. Billy Sheen you're exactly. like the best right. of all, you know, and, it's, and he fucking makes mistakes, you know, and doesn't bother him at all either, by the way. He just he fucking, you know, he yeah. just laughs about it because that's what you're doing. You're playing live, and that's part of the fun. Well, those, those guys, they know, you know, they understand what it's like to feel. Yeah. You know, like they, they all picked up instruments for different reasons and eventually they got that feel and they go, okay, this is what my fucking soul, my heart beats on, you know? And I love that. I, you know, my friend, I grew up with Bumblefoot who's in Sons of Apollo with Billy. Okay. And, uh, you know, I know that he loves being in that band because everybody challenges each other. Yeah. But it's also like he says, man, like the, the fuck ups are epic sometimes, you know, like, because <laughs> you got like, you know, five guys that are just at the top of their game. And when one person goes off, like the whole thing is off the rails. And that's where he gets that feeling from, from, you know, from doing that, you know, so it's, it's freaking great. No, oh, yeah, that happens when we do the uh, the blue collar bastard stuff, man. Right, the Primus yeah. tribute. It's like you're moving at such a pace and you're doing such a ridiculous thing right. that it's like you really have to keep that that rhythm going. It's yeah. like because that train can derail so easily. It's, and I, you know, I always wondered if when, uh, you know, like when 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 Les was putting that together. Yeah. You know. I know his background, and, and I know like, like the dude like digs like the Isley Brothers and all this funky shit. But when he put that together with with the other two guys and went, listen, here's the deal: there's going to be a point in every show where we might crash and burn. Are you good with that? Oh yeah. I don't think there's a lot of guys that are. I think there's a lot of guys, but I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Because I mean, I've seen Primus live a few times, and yeah. And I've seen you guys, but like it, you get to that point, you go, man, where the fuck is this going? Oh yeah. You know? and then it just like goes into something else. Like, oh okay, they know what they were doing the whole time. They're fine. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like I prefer uh, to see them with uh, when they're experimenting. You right. know, like uh, the last time I saw them was with Slayer when they did the uh, the final the farewell right, okay. with Slayer, uh -huh. and uh, and that set was very much um, the the cookie cutter. Like, here's all. I mean, yeah, great. I mean, they they were it wasn't a primate show. They right. weren't there to fucking play three hours of you yeah. know psychedelic fucking <laughs> jamolas, right? It was uh, it was like here's. The, all the fucking songs you know right. from the 90s and we're out yep. enjoy slayer <laughs> and uh and and that kind of shit you know that ends up being that like that perfection type thing we talk about where it's like they can just go out and walk that uh, oh yeah you know all day long but then when they start getting into it and they do a 12 minute version of southbound pachyderm that's right. like twisting into three <laughs> other songs and then comes back around and it's like do they even know what the fuck they're doing right and sometimes they start jamming and they got you know you can see them look each other in the fucking eyes on stage because they're not on like a uh, account anymore, yeah. right? They're just like no, they're fucking. Just the let Lur just go for a little right. while, right? <laughs> he's going, he's going, he's going. He'll give us a nod. Yeah, exactly. When, when, when he's, he's done ready. with it, yeah. He'll give you that, that little wink, you know. Yeah. Same thing like when I saw, you know, I, I see Ween. Uh, I love Ween, one of my favorite bands. Yeah. And that's the same thing. You never know what they, they don't even know what they're going to do half the time. Like they write the set 10 minutes before they get on, and it's like they're either going to do seven songs that are 30 minutes long, or they're going to do 35 songs that are two minutes long, <laughs> and you never know what it's going to say. I, I saw them. Uh, when they first came back, I went to Denver with, with my best friend. We flew out for two shows, and uh, they played three shows. We couldn't get tickets to the third show. They played a different set each night. They never repeated a song, and like we saw it, it was fucking incredible. And then I downloaded a show from like the next week, and it was a different set list again. And I had seen them do like eight of those like you know twelve songs, and they played them completely differently. That's awesome. Like not even close to being the same. I was like. Why is there five verses in this song? Yeah, so yeah, that's that's what I love. I love that shit. That's just amazing. 
That uh, that reminds me of uh, when I used to work with the uh, the Imagine Dragons back in the day when uh-huh. they were first starting out, and uh, they would change every single night. They right. would they would go on stage, and my, my favorite part they're all Berkeley trained musicians. Sure, yeah. So and they, they, they kind of know what they're doing. Yeah. So like uh, <laughs> like I, I can kind of get a, I, I can get around right, but right. I'm not a fucking Berkeley trained musician. <laughs> they're on stage and they just have a discussion about it. They don't uh, have their instruments in their hand. They don't really? go. They don't ever go the WWW part. Right. They don't fucking say that kind of stuff to each other. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. They don't go. You're doing bop to bop to bop. Yeah. That's no, not no, no. that's not what happens right. in the discussion, right? And then they change the whole fucking song, and right. it's it's. A completely different song and uh i just loved that every time i'd mix them man it would just right. be like fucking you know they were just like well let's try this uh-huh. tonight you know and then let's try this with this song and then they would just go experiment and have fun with it it was great see like that's we it's funny like that communication that musicians have that we make up our own languages and stuff oh we the, do the funniest thing i ever heard though was 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 barry barnes mm-hmm. and i i, I want to say who i think he was talking to but if i'm wrong i'm going to sound really stupid so i'm not going to say the person's name but they were doing like a jam one night and this guitar player was very technical and he's telling Barry okay we're gonna, we're gonna be in the key of E and then we're gonna go to the G minor set and, and, and he's going on and on and finally Barry goes dude am I on the dots or off that's all I need to know <laughs> And, I, and he's like, you're talking fucking math right now. Just on the dots. I'm like, that's the most amazing thing I've ever heard. Like, that's yes. where I'm at with him too, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> Let's play the fucking song. Can I see you? Can, can you just play the part real quick for me? Right, yeah. Let me see your hands real quick. We're good. We're good now. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me see your hands for two seconds real quick. I, know, okay, I, actually, I, know I, I did a show with Barry one night, and um, we only had one rehearsal before we can play. It was uh, I, I was sitting in for... Um, Bad Little Sister back when Kim was still in the band and everything. And, uh, uh, no, Gypsy Road. I'm, I apologize. It was Gypsy Road. And uh, I did one quick rehearsal, and there was a part in the song I couldn't get, and I literally videotaped Barry's hands. And I went home, because it was a little, like, run that we both had to do, and like, yeah. Pat Benatar song or some shit. And I just watched Barry's fingers for fucking 20 minutes learning that shit. So, yeah, I get it. Absolutely. <laughs> I do the same shit when I got to learn a song. I'll look, I'll, I'll, I'll look him up on YouTube playing live. Right. Just like, oh, that's how you do oh, it. Oh, okay, okay. I see what he's fucking doing yeah. now. I get it. Because I can't do that ear shit. I mean, I've been playing guitar mm-hmm. 30 years. Yeah. You know, I, I got friends that are like that. They hear the song once. Like, oh, that's in the key of D major. Like, how the fuck do you know that? Yeah. You know? Some people have talents. Yeah, and, and, I don't. You know? Then at all. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't either. I never, you know, and 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 that comes from, uh, and those people put an effort too. Mm-hmm. You know, they learn that shit. And yeah. They, it's like it's like it's like learning another language. Right. You know, it's I like tried being, learning it. I just can't. Yeah. Like some people don't yeah. grasp it. You know, like I could play just about anything. But to actually learn shit is just like it's a nightmare for me. Yeah, that's why you go. Like, how did you end up in cover bands for fifteen years? Well, because I wanted to make a little money. I guess that's why. You know, mm-hmm. but like, I would get like this pit in my stomach whenever I got hired to do something, especially out here. Um, when somebody called, "Hey Dominic, we need you. Can you please fill in on Friday? No problem. Okay, here's twenty five songs," and I'd be like, "Fuck," because it wasn't easy for me. You know, and then you get like a guy like like when I play with Brent Muscat, and the dude would like literally call me when I was. Pulling up to the venue, like into, he's like, "Hey, do you know this song?" But like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar. We're playing that tonight. You're doing the solo." Oh fuck! <laughs> I'm literally in the parking lot, dude. All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I get that. I get that too, man. And it's like, uh, you know, well, you can play all that fucking the, those crazy bass lines and shit. Right. And it's like, well, yeah, but I mean, like, I practice. I that practice a lot. those exactly. Yeah, like I'm not some <laughs> aficionado or anything. Right. Guys, like I know that's like. The guy I'm mimicking is, right. you know, but like I'm just a fucking dude who can who can practice and yeah. and and replicate. I'm a mirror, as, kind of, right? As as well as I you can. You always fake it, always fake. Yeah, it. it's I it's a it fake it till you make it kind so of situation. Always, yeah, like like my father because he's a guitar player, but he he never really learned how to play lead. He was always a rhythm player, and he was like, "How do you learn solos?" I'm like, "It's I don't." And he's like, "What do you mean?" I said, "I take the song that I have to play and I get the five notes that everybody remembers. Yeah, I learn those five and then I make everything else up. Yeah, because it doesn't matter. Like name." a guitar solo it doesn't matter what song it is everybody knows five notes out of it yeah if you hit those five notes you've got it yeah you know you're not gonna sit here for 20 minutes you know learning a three second solo it's not gonna happen yeah, yeah. especially whenever you got uh 25 songs to fucking learn exactly i don't have you time know? you gotta you move know? the fuck along here yeah and then i'm not trying to impress anybody with my fucking guitar chops trust me yeah yeah that in this town <laughs> 
No, I did, it's uh, it does make a difference sometimes though. I do uh, I do remember we I went through uh, a couple of uh, guitar players when I was starting out with the the bastards, and then Anthony came along, mm-hmm. and like uh, the other guys were amazing guitar players. Uh, you know, Jason Constantine and, yeah. and Spider, mm-hmm. uh, and and they were just fucking shredding, and they were doing Constantine solos and Spider solos, right. and, you know, like they were playing it their way. And uh, I, when Anthony came in and actually like note for noted. Yeah. These fucking Larry Lalonde guitar solos, which is incredibly weird. Exactly. And it's like, how the fuck did you even yeah. learn that? How did you pick that out? Yeah. No, man, but it changed the whole thing whenever right. we started playing live. And I was like, fuck, that's the song now, isn't it? <laughs> Holy shit. That's what that Does sounds make like. A, it makes a huge difference. And, it, and, and you know, and, um, and, I, and, I, and that one's particularly because... It seems like they're just fucking around, right. doing all this noise. Yep, but no, and it's like saying. it's so not, and it just they just do it so well. You think that's oh, what's yeah. happening, and it's like it's very well thought out, and it's like, and it's in a fucking, it's in a scale. You like listen back to, you're like, what the fuck was that? Right, and then, no, it's it's very well organized. See, what kills me is when you find shit like that, and then you, I'm not saying it's easy, but like. For years, I, I I was never a Kiss fan. Okay? Yeah, and I'm still not. Um, <laughs> but uh, I I did uh, one of the Kiss nights uh, with Lady Chameleon, and I had to learn um, Detroit Rock City, right? Yeah. Which I never liked the song to begin with, and I hear the solo, and I'm like, oh god, like I'm never gonna be able to learn this. And then you realize it's like the easiest solo in the history of the world. Yeah. But my brain had told me it was way too difficult. You know. So I can imagine when you go through that shit. Yeah. Because I also had to do uh, one time a solo with uh, with Bryant. We were doing Crazy Train, which I've never played in my life. And yeah, you're doing the solo. I'm like, fuck, I can go home and learn how to do fucking Crazy Train. The reality is it's actually not that hard of a solo. It's actually fairly easy if you have the basics of tapping and stuff like that. It's the phrasing that makes it sound better than, well, not better, makes it sound more difficult than it is, you okay. know? And I think it's the same thing with a lot of, uh, you know, for instance, with, with Les's, his, his bass lines are fucked sometimes, but it's the extra shit that he does. Yeah. It's the tapping on that fretboard, that little click that he gets that makes it sound a lot bigger than it actually is, you know? Yeah, he'll do he'll do simple things like he'll he'll hit and then come down with his fingers. Right, that, like that double percussive thing right, he's got. Yeah, yeah, and so it's like, it, it sounds like three notes, even though you're really just, you're just going for that one note, right. but if you hit the open, and then slap it, and then come down, and, and then mm-hmm. you know, it, it, and and put pressure. It's it's it, you yeah. know, it, it does this weird thing. But then that motherfucker, I'll go see him live, and uh, and I'll watch him play, and and I'm doing these things that I used to watch him do in videos in like the '90s and shit. Right. And then now he's just so fucking fast. He'll sit there and he'll like he he's like he's like showing off like fucking badass metalheads like Slayer would do the right. downstrokes. Just every every note's a downstroke. Fuck you, <laughs> right? And it's just like he's sitting there with his thumb just going. He'll do the my name is mud. Right. And he's doing it with one all downstrokes. Guy's a beast. Guy's a fucking beast. I can't do that. No, that's these guys they operate on different levels. Yeah. Yeah, they really do. I mean, like I said, I grew up with Bumblefoot and the dude operates on a level that me, you, most people don't get. I remember Ronnie coming to my house and uh you know, I was a teenager. He was Ronnie's about five years older than me, somewhere around that. So I was maybe fifteen or sixteen. He comes back like nineteen or twenty, and uh, he comes to my house one day and he's like, "Dude, he's like, I wrote the song. Um, can I use your guitar really quick?" And I'm like, "Yeah, of course." And he starts pulling paper like napkins from IHOP out of his pants, right? And it's like four different napkins with notation on it. And he just grabs me a guitar and he's like, blah, 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 the most intricate, crazy you know, neoclassical bullshit you ever heard in your life. I'm like, when would you write that? Oh, I was having pancakes, and I heard it, so I wrote it down. I'm like, nobody <laughs> does that. Like, yeah. that's, you know, that's ridiculous, but that's how he operates, you know, and you could you could get to the point where you can not necessarily mimic it. You can just kind of get on that same playing field, but they're still going to be the star pitcher. Yeah. You're going to be the relief guy, you know, if, you, if you're lucky enough at that point. So it's I commend people like that because I can't do it. Yeah. yeah, and the, there's just some people that's just brains work differently. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like they, they, they they're just functioning on uh, a whole other world, man. Yeah. And uh, you know, and those people are fucking so terrible at so many other things. Though. Generally, you, yes. know, you watch them do that, and you're like, man, that's fucking impressive. Right. But then it's like you watch them try to function as a human being, <laughs> and it's like, oh, someone needs to step in and right. help that person function a yeah. little bit because they're lost in this fucking. Their musicianship's incredible. And it, it's absolutely. Like, um, 
yeah, it's just one of those things where, uh, and not to say Bumblefoot is non-functional. No, no, he's. But uh, you know, you know, just saying, it, just some of these people that I've great. met that are just, yeah. In, yeah, super, super talented people like that are yeah. just, yeah. Ronnie but, used to like he had this thing when we were growing up where he would change his parents' um, answering machine without yeah. telling them, right? And Ronnie's parents were great. Like they were your typical, new, stereotypical New York Jewish couple, you know. And you know, like you'd come out, you'd be like, "Oh, Ronald, your friends are here," like that type of thing, yeah. And he would change their their answering machine, and he would like scream Kenneth for three minutes. That was the answering machine. So you like somebody, one of his father's like business partners would call up the house, and the answering machine would just be Ronnie screaming the name Kenneth for three <laughs> minutes straight. You know, like, uh, again, like yeah. So I get it. That's <laughs> I, fantastic. I totally yeah. Get it, you know, then he make guitars out of batteries that are laying around the house. Yeah, they just love the guy. He's amazing. He's still a really good friend of mine. But yeah, like I, I look at him like, how did you think to do that? Yeah. Like, you know, I remember when he made his, he made a, um, a guitar out of loose change, you know, and like the fret, he, he took all this change that he found in his house, it was like eleven dollars, yeah, and he sanded everything down, and then he took a blowtorch and melted all the cha- and put it in the fretboard, and he called it the spare change guitar, and the thing worked, and it sounded incredible. That's ridiculous. Yeah, he was crazy, and I'm like, how do you think to, like, how do you wake up one morning and go? Make a guitar to spare change. You know? Yeah, like I couldn't fucking do that shit. You know? Oh, you why would you why would you even attempt to? Yeah, but look what it's done for him. Like you know, like with the the line of guitars he makes with like, like, Vigier and stuff. Yeah. You know, he's got thirty six frets on those fucking guitars. Yeah, and so uh, nobody would have to think to do stuff like that, but because he operates on that wavelength, it's like no, I want to hit a note three octaves higher than the E string. You know? Yeah. All right, if it works for you, dude. You know? Fuck it, right? <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, man. I almost bought a, a bass from, uh, damn, what was his name? He used to fucking make guitars out here, and he passed away re- uh, a while back. Oh, um, ah, oh, shit. Uh, but can... he was doing 36 fucking uh, fret basses. Really? Basses? Yeah, they were real, real long necks, man. And they were fucking cool. I was, he had, he had a couple of them that he made that I was playing around with, and then, uh, but then he passed away, like, yeah, a, right. a few months hell? after that. Before I, can, I, got, I know before exactly. I was able to buy it from him. Yeah, I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah, I can't yeah. His name right now, but and yeah, that's he a had shame. that guitar shop up in. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, he ain't selling guitars no more. No, I think they, they isn't the shop still open? Like his Is it? kid or took it over or something like that? Or? I don't know. It was in his house. Uh, last I saw. Oh really? Yeah, he had like a fucking Roman, 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 Ed Roman, Ed Roman. Yeah, yeah. I think they have a. I don't want to say it's a storefront. I could be wrong, but I thought they had reopened it. Maybe just online it was, or something like that, where you can still get like some of the guitars and stuff. So yeah, because his the, the dudes he had building guitars and the yeah. guitars he was designing, they were fucking really cool, Absolutely. really cool guitars, man. Yeah, that guy was a fucking trip, by the way. Was like, he really? Yeah, I never, I never got a chance to like, he was really cool, dude. meet him or anything, you know. So yeah, it, 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 well, you know, eccentric motherfucker living they, up there. Most of them are. Yeah. <laughs> I love eccentric people, man. Right, they're, just, they're, they're so much fun. Yeah. I look forward to having more eccentric people on the the podcast and picking their brains. I'm and like the about least weird eccentric person, shit. so. No, no, no. You're a musician, my friend. That uh, automatically puts you in the uh, eccentric category. Maybe a little bit, but I'm not like I'm not like one of those. Cra- I really think there are people that are eccentric just to the point to say they are eccentric. Yeah. You know, like. You know, like you, like you see those people like every time they're being interviewed on TV or a, for a radio station, something they're like, okay, I need to have like a bunch of lavender candles, you know, going at all times. Like, shut the fuck up! Like, really? Like, I have done more. This is one of the first interviews I've done with pants on, and I don't know how long. Because usually I'm just in my house, just like, uh, you know, right? all that shit. So, but yeah, I, I I actually know people like that. Like, and I love them personally. I think they're great people. But it's kind of like. If we're hanging out like me and you are right now, everything is fine. And then the minute the camera starts up, it's like, hold on a second. I gotta go inside and put on my peach eyeliner. I'm like, why? You know, but yeah. So just so people think they're eccentric, I guess. I don't know. I know, dude, I, I know exactly what you mean by yeah, that. You yeah, probably I know. know most of them. Too. I know a lot of those people, yeah, <laughs> that are exactly that way. And, uh, yeah, they will. They'll be fucking super chill and like just a normal motherfucker. But the, the cameras start rolling, and it's like, hang on That's a it. second, let me break my persona out. Yeah, this exactly. is what I want to project mm-hmm. to the world, and the world is, you know, yeah. this is, it's a character too, like, uh, and a product that they're selling to. Well, pe- that's fun. The public. If, if you're gonna if. If you're trying to, I'm sorry, I'm keep moving this fucking thing. It's like keep it's adjusting. okay. It's got all those like fancy hinges I know, and it's springs like really and cool. gizmos. It's, like, it's fun to move. I'm, I move mine like twenty five thousand times. Like, well, I know that you're gonna hear that dong sound and everything. Yeah. But nah, like, these mics are great, man. You don't hear none of that shit. If you're starting off with a persona that you want to, you know, sell to people, that is absolutely fine. You know, and and I'm talking like you can go to the extremes, like you know, like King fucking Diamond. Yeah. You know, but like exactly. you, yeah. But but and if you want to live in that twenty four seven, that is absolutely fine. The thing that gets me is when it's so obviously 
an, an act. Yeah. You know, and it's like, dude, you don't ha- like people are digging you as you are right now. You kind of don't have to go do that, you know. And I still see it to this day. And here's the funny, I guess it's because we just get older. Yeah. Like me, like I said, you know, I'm a middle-aged dude, man. I see middle-aged dudes around town, and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Like, like stop. Like, like, do you really have a cucumber in your pants right now? Is that what you're doing? Like, are we still doing this? You know? Like, you're 60. Stop. That's <laughs> fantastic. Isn't it? It's like, what are you doing? You know? It's really the truth, you know? They, yeah. get all, uh, they get all dressed up in leather and spikes and fuck, chains. And man. They're yeah. fucking, you know, they're that shit jackets is not from the 80s. Yeah. No, and it's like yeah. they go out and it's like, who the fuck are you trying to impress, man? Yeah. You know, what, are you, what is this? Uh, and I'm like guilty. Like, uh, like but, we, I mean, we, when else are they going to wear it, right? Well, they that's the whole that thing. fucking leather jacket with the spikes on it, so... <laughs> You know, and I'll admit it, like I said here, I'm vain. Like, right now, like, it is everything yeah. in my power not to look at the fucking monitor to see what a fat blob I look like. It's know? hard. It's hard not yeah. to, you know? And, like, when I go on stage and stuff like that, I'm, you know, I some I have stage makeup on sometimes. Like, if I've got, like, a big fucking, you know, if I cut myself shaving, I got yeah. concealer on that shit. And, uh, you, you know, should, though. Yeah, well, you know, I'll wear the tighter, you know, the, the, the tighter pants, you know, that I normally wear. And but I also think that you need you know you should give people a, a representation of what they're looking for, but it also has to get to the point. If I went on stage right now with like a spiked fucking thing and leather pants and you know was talking about you know fucking you know sixteen year old girls, it'd be creepy. Yeah. At this point, that's mm-hmm. why like you know my band is kind of you know we're not better than anybody else, but like because of the type of genres we play, the subject matter doesn't really age, you know? Everybody yeah. is frustrated, everybody's angry, everybody's been in love, like everybody's got that, so that's cool. You know, I could not write a song called, you know, hey, hey, let's go party, because I don't party, because party's not a fucking verb. And I, you know, <laughs> like, I don't want to go party, I pretty much want to stay at home, you know, yeah. so. <laughs> I got a hair in my mouth. No, oh, no, uh, no worries. Uh, no, it's like, uh, yeah, uh what was it? Uh, Kip Winger. We did Kip Winger, uh-huh. and he had the fucking song. She's only seventeen, but now right. he sings. She's now what? she's thirty-five or something. Thirty-five. Like, okay. Yeah, it's fucking hil- hilarious, yeah. man. You know, like he, you know, he's not out there being didn't a creeper. Well. That, yeah, it didn't age well, but it's this hit song, right? And he still goes out and he's like a real person about it. Yeah, you know, which I, I dig. I, I dig that. Like I, I've, I've met Kip. Um, I, I can't say I, I've had any. Stretch of a conversation with the guy, I respect him. He's, he's a smart a, guy. He's smart and he's a very good musician. Um, I rag on him just like I rag on anybody else because yeah, and it, because of that shit, you know. And it's fun. The, you know, here's the funny thing: like I grew up in the you know in the '90s, and uh, I was in bands starting from 1990, and started putting records out like pretty soon after that. And even I was kind of like, man, some of this stuff isn't going to age well, you yeah. know? Because back then, Mick Jagger was in his 40s and 50s, and I remember Mick Jagger looking kind of weird jumping around and grabbing the shit you know like i don't know how that's gonna look and it'll you know and you know i didn't know 30 years later he'd still be fucking doing it now it's yeah. like hey dude you're 75 grab your dick go for it man yeah it, <laughs> there was a transitional period and right. now it's great again now it's, it's awesome like fucking again. yeah dude yeah. you know more power to you i right. can't believe he can even do that like let alone towers still doing backflips and shit go ahead fucking yeah i know dude <laughs> if you could still function like that at that age, man, oh, God, more, dude, good for you. Yeah, good can, for you. I can barely wake up in the morning and get out of bed. And these, like, that's the thing that gets me like guys like Steven Tyler. It's like, okay, not only are you 73, but you were a goddamn junkie for 25 years. Yeah, what the fuck? Right? Like, remember when they, like, when him and, and uh, Joe Perry got all buff, like, in the 90s? Yeah. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me right now? Because I was, you know, in 1993, I was... 18 and I already had a pot belly and these guys are all fucking ripped to shit and everything and they're on a treadmill 10 hours a day and I was still like mainlining Jack Daniels at the point at that point and they're like how the fuck do you do that? and now 70 still fucking doing it and I'm mm-hmm. like sitting on the couch like you know lifting up this water bottle is all the exercise we're gonna get today you know and gotta I'm exercise man gotta exercise yeah I got enough shit going on I always tell people like and I, I fucking give my parents shit about it. Right. it there's another transition that happened where I'm the fucking guy going over kicking my folks out of bed right going get the fuck up it's like noon what are you doing in bed you know let's walk around the block you gotta exercise eat some drink some water right. it's eat healthy Dude. and uh but I try I always give them shit about um just try to get your heart rate up right. and sweat a little bit like do that for 30 minutes yeah. like three times a week and that's all I and I've I, tried. and it's like man, it's like it, you'll feel so much better with, I, you, with I never, yourself and with the your problem life. is I never do. Like, yeah, I, I need like I was telling Andrew, I, I need two back surgeries. Oh yeah, I'm going to need a knee replacement. I'm going to need a hip replacement. I've already been told that a million times. So anything that like one night at Vamped, yeah, I am in bed for two days usually. Oof. You know, 
And like we had a, a a weekend last year where we played three nights in a row. We did four hours one night, then we did an hour and a half at Vamp the next night, and then we had to do the Rock and Roll Marathon. We did three hours that night. Yeah. By the time Monday came along, like luckily I had taken two days off from work because I couldn't get out of bed. I mean, it was just agony, you know? And so I use that as an excuse, and I know it's an excuse. Like, I'm not beyond that. It's a fucking excuse. But I'm like, yeah, I can't, you know. At least you can admit that. Yeah, I can't go jogging because my knee's bad. Yeah, and don't like, jog. Yeah. Well, stop do, jump, some, do some power walking. Stop jumping on fucking jump rises, yeah. too, at fucking 40-something years old. Yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. I, uh, I, I catch myself telling some of the younger kids now, like, I'll see them fucking jumping off the stage. Yeah. And, uh, and I fucking hate that I can even say some of the younger kids now. Right. God damn it. I'm fucking getting old. <laughs> but uh, I see them do it, and I go, no. Oh, and they're like, what? And I go, oh, bro, if I could go back fucking 15, 20 years and stop myself from jumping off stages. Right. Oh, my knees are garbage. I know. It's like, hey, guys, do you ever hear a patella? Let me tell you what happens when that yeah. shit goes away. <laughs> oh, dude, it's so rough. Yeah. It's so rough. Like, you, know, you can't be doing that shit. No. I remember when I found out my hip was gone. Yeah. You know, because I always thought it was just pain from my, I had a car accident like 10 years ago. So I have like this, my back's just shot. And about like, I don't know, five years ago, I started getting this really bad hip pain. And the one doctor I was going to was like, oh, it's because you have a pinched nerve and it's going. And I'm like, okay, fine. And then every day I was like, man, this shit, like, I, to the point where I can't walk. I go to another doctor and he's like, let's take an x ray. He's like, oh, man, your hip socket's gone. You need a new hip. And I'm like, at the time I was like 40, maybe, you know, 39. Yeah. I'm like, when? He's like, well, you can do it now if you want. I'm like, I'm not going to do that shit now. Jesus. Yeah, and he's like, well, you probably got another five to ten years, but you're going to have to get it done. Oh. So now five years later, I mean, like, I get up and, like, I'll get off this couch and you'll hear snap. And I'm like, yep, that's my hip. You know, it's just bone on bone right there. You know, God so, damn, yeah. man. And it's from 30 years of being a musician, you yeah. know, jumping up and down and fucking jumping on stage. I used to be a lot crazier than I am now, yeah. you know, because I was younger and drunker. Basically, <laughs> that's brutal, man. That's yeah. fucked up, dude. They, I mean, are you just taking fucking Tylenol for that shit? Or, dude, I live you know? on ibuprofen. Ibuprofen, yeah. yeah I don't take anything. Um, I th the worst I'll take is like a gabapentin, but that's mostly yeah. for back pain because of the because I have so much nerve damage. Yeah. Um, but that's like good, man. for uh, arthritis in my knee and everything, it's like just ibuprofen. I don't do anything else. Are you are you taking like uh, supplemental like uh, glucosamine I or did, MSM complex I or took, something um, like that? I did take glucosamine for a little while for the knee. Yeah. Um, but it's like I, I never saw anything enough where I was like, well, okay, that's making a huge difference. Yeah, you know, know? it takes and, a while to build yeah, up. Yeah, and every time I went to the doctor, they were always trying to give me some. Like they they tried giving me fucking they gave me Lortab, and then they wanted to give me fucking Soma, and I'm no, like, no, 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 I don't need no, any of this no. shit. You know, then you're just gonna hurt yourself more. Absolutely, and that's the whole point. You know, I've gotten the the injections too. Like I used to get uh, epidurals like once every six months in my lower back and in my the hip and stuff. I haven't been able to get those for a while though. But even that fucks me up because then I feel good. Yeah. It's like, oh, I can jump again. No, you can't, dumbass. No. You know? <laughs> supposed to be jumping. Yeah, it's like, stop it. You know? It's funny because every time oh, I'm on stage and I'll do something retarded, yeah. Stephanie, my fiance, will be in the front of the stage and she'll look at me and she'll go, and then as we were driving home, she's like, you're going to be hurting tomorrow. I'm like, yeah, I know. Yeah. And then. I was next, excited. Yeah. Next thing you know, five o'clock in the morning, babe, get my ibuprofen. <laughs> 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 I need a heating pad. <laughs> That's it, man. <laughs> Oh, if I could go back and stop myself from jumping uh, off the stage right? so many times. God damn it. Yeah. It's bullshit, dude. I remember when we were kids and we were playing in like metal bands and punk bands and shit. Yep. We'd be playing shit shows where there's like, you know, there's nobody at right. you know, the fucking small bar. And we'd already done our set. I'd be piss ass drunk. And I thought it was fucking hilarious to jump off the stage and pretend to like crowd surf. <laughs> With like, nobody there? There's like five people, you know? <laughs> I would just dive right into them. And I, right? It's fucking funny. I, mean, it's, right. I fucked my shoulder yeah. all up. Up and fuck my, <laughs> it's just dumb, dumb kid it shit. It is. It's it's really it, it, the funny thing is that you don't realize how stupid that shit is until something else happens. Yeah. So like like when I got into my car accident, right? Um, it wasn't a major car accident. I got hit by a guy going like 15 miles an hour. It wasn't awful, but he hit me just enough that it fucked everything up. And then I woke up and I had no feeling in my pinky, oh. and I have you know tingling in my hand and all this shit. And I'm a guitar player, so now I can't play guitar anymore. At least not like I used to, you know. I was never I was never a shredder or a speed demon, but I was able to do a lot of stuff I can't do anymore. So now I have to relearn how to do the guitar. I, I, like People always make fun of me when I play. If you ever look at pictures, my hand's always like this. Okay. And it's because I have no feeling in my pinky, so I use this finger a lot more. I kind of play like a claw, you know. And you sit there and you go, wow, that one little thing fucked me up. 
And then you go, but all that jumping around fucked this up. Yeah. I could have stopped that. Yeah. You know? This was an accident. This was fucking on purpose, you know? <laughs> this was stupid. God damn it. <laughs> yeah, it was fun, though. Yeah, it Out was. Out there living life, man, yeah, having fun. fun. Mm hmm there's nothing better than, uh, you know, looking back on a life spent playing music and, and yeah. fucking, you know, having a good time and doing what you love. You, you know what? And then you get, I have more appreciation of it now than appreciate, appreciate it back then yeah. at all. I mean, I started young, man. I was joined my first band at like 14. And by the time I was 16, I had already like put a record out and started doing all these big shows and stuff. And uh, by the time I was 18 or 19, I had already been signed and dropped by like, I don't know how many fucking labels and shit. And um, I had put together a band with a, a couple of friends of mine, and we put out a record, and we were shopping it over the place. And get, there was a, literally a bidding war that happened, and then everything fell apart. And at the end of the day, nobody got any money. <clears throat> the album fucking died, in, you know, on the shelf. And I was 21 years old and massively in debt, and I was miserable. And I'm like. I should have been enjoying all of that, but I was so concerned with business and business and business. You know, and then as I started playing music, as I got older, I did the cover band and stuff like that. And then when Wicked Garden started doing original music, I was like, wow, this is why I started doing this. It was fun. Yeah. The expression was great. I don't care now. Like, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm obsessed with how the album's doing. I wake up every morning, and the first thing I do is I check Spotify and Apple Music, see how many times it's been streamed and how many countries it's in. And when I get my BMI statements, I tear through that shit, you know. But that's just because I'm a fucking scatterbrain. I want to know everything that's going on. I'm a control freak. But back, you know, I don't, like, I don't sit at home, like, depressed. Like, oh, you know, our record only got streamed 30 times yesterday. Like, I don't do that. <laughs> you know, if streaming was a... That would drive you crazy. Yeah, if streaming was around 25 years ago, I would have fucking shot myself in the head because I'd be like, oh, no, we was the record today. Who fucking cares? Yeah. You know, and, and I, guess, I guess it's kind of like the, uh, it's the double-edged sword of, of, of technology. I can instantly tell if people like us. Yeah. Or if we suck. Yeah. I don't know which is worse. <laughs> well, and it's like uh, not all of it's people are interacting with your shit either. Yeah. You know, people will scroll through and they'll watch it for a second. No, oh, that's yeah, cool. Whatever. And they, it's not like they don't fucking. It's not like they don't like you. Right. right? Mm -hmm. That's the hard thing. Well, but. The, the funny thing is when it ends up on weird shit. Like, yeah. We had a song that ended up on a, like, you know, with Spotify, everything's about playlists. You got to get on playlists, right? And what you, like, you know, this, I'm going to give away all the secrets now that people don't know how the music business actually works, is you either pay somebody to do it for you, or you're like me, and you spend literally hours a fucking day sending emails and making phone calls. And I got in touch with some guy, and he's like, I got five playlists, I really like your song, put it on there. It ended up on like an urban hip hop playlist, right? Fun. Great. Now it got streamed about, I think it was on there for about a week, and it got streamed like almost 2,000 times because nice. it was a massive playlist. But I'm like, how many of those people actually bought it, streamed it, saved it? Probably, and you can see the save function. Yeah. Like two people saved it. Yeah. You know? And it was probably by accident. They probably wanted to go skip and hit the heart button, you know? Ah. <laughs> no. So, it's, so it's, it's, it's instant gratification, and then it's also instant depression, and then it's also like, what the fuck actually happened there? You know, like, that's the part I think that kind of like, keeps me at it, because I'm always like, trying to figure out what does this mean. Yesterday, one of our songs got played like 800 times like in fucking Russia. Yeah. I'm like, what the fuck is going on that people are playing us in Russia now? Because nobody listened to us in Russia for the last year this album's been out. All of a sudden, yesterday, 800 people decided to play it. Yeah. It means something. Somebody put it on a playlist, and it just happens to be a popular one. You know, so good for us. I was talking to uh, Rob Hussey uh, from Cyanide, yeah. and he was saying that Nikki Six in Disguise song right. that they released, mm -hmm. that fucking got so many hits after the Motley Crue yeah. movie came out on uh, Netflix. What was that movie called? Yeah, uh, The Dirt. The Dirt. Yeah, he's told me about that. I liked it. Every, some people didn't like it. I thought it was, it was okay. a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's just Motley Crue, right? It's right. It's supposed to be a fucking dumb party movie. Exactly. Like, what did you, like, what did you, did you expect War and Peace? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, really. It wasn't yeah. Gone with the Wind. Yeah, no shit, because it's fucking Motley Crue. Right away, Tommy Lee's diving in between some chick's legs, seeing Absolutely. how far he can make her squirt across yeah. the room. I was like, all right, yeah, this is <laughs> It's great. Good, good, good movie. It's funny because we, <laughs> me and Stephanie, was a bunch of people that had just seen the movie, and we had seen. It. We saw it the day it came out because Stephanie's a huge uh, uh, Motley fan. And then like, Dominic, what'd you think of the movie? And I'm like, did you guys know that Nikki Six did heroin? <laughs> and they just looked at me like, yeah. And I'm like, 
I was shocked. And they thought I was fucking serious. Jesus. Like, that's all this dude's been talking about since 1992. Yeah, his whole life. Yeah. Anytime you see anything. He wrote a whole book about doing Like, heroin. three of them. Yeah, like. <laughs> and then he re-released it. It's like, now with a forward about what? Doing more heroin. Yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's fucking shit, yeah. Fucking Nikki Six. I can't believe that dude's still alive. How is he still alive after all know. the heroin he's done? Well, I do. I mean, like, heroin's super addictive, but I guess it's not that destructive to the body, technically. I think it's I like guess. you not eating and you not exercising that's really more destructive because of the addiction. Right. So I, I don't know. Well, right? what I, I guess you can do a lot of it. I mean, what I've heard, and I, look, I've never done it, and I know people that not only have done it, I know people that have died from it, I know people yeah. that have came back and, like, oh, I'll never do that again. And they'll think about it every day. Though. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They'll they think do. about it every day. And they always tell me the same thing. It's like, you know, uh, the people that die from it generally are the people who've tried to quit. Yeah. And then what happens is they automatically think they can go back to doing what they did before. You know, if you're doing and I don't know measurements, but if you're doing a fucking, you know, 15 milliliters a day mm. and then you quit for six months and you go, I, I fuck it, I'm getting off the wagon and hit 15, you're going to die. Yeah. Because your body's like, whoa, I'm not ready for this shit. You yeah. Know? So I think he just because he steadily just shot it up for so long and then cold turkeyed it. Maybe that's why he survived. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and uh, yeah, it's the same thing with like uh, with like alcohol or something yeah. like that. You know, if you if you get off the booze and you go back in there, man, it's like you do like two shots. You're fucked. Oh, yeah. You, you're you're going to be drunk. Absolutely. Uh, even though you could fucking drink a whole bottle before. I yeah. spent from 1992 to basically, let's see, when my kids were born, 2000, about 1998 in a drunken fucking stupor. Yeah. Every day I was drunk. And then I quit drinking for two years. And then I had my kids and everything. And, and I started casually drinking like I do now but I can tell you there is no fucking way I was able, able to drink I did 20 years ago yeah and no I, way. I I mean when I hear stories of how I used to drink I'm like how the fuck why did you let me do that you know you're supposed to be my friend yeah <laughs> you really let me drink a whole bottle of Jack Daniels and then have a beer what the fuck is wrong with you you know fucking crazy man. <laughs> I remember my alcoholism uh, one, of the, one of the stories I like to tell about how bad it had gotten was uh I worked all night, which meant I was drinking all night, right? right? Where I'm at a club mixing sound. And uh, and then at the end of the night, uh, me and John Zito, who is notoriously a very good drinker. Yes, he is. He's, uh, we, he's I drank with him, uh, just straight whiskey, right. until Zito's like uh, getting carried off by Barry. <laughs> right? and like, fucking he's out of here. We close the bar down, and the bartenders are like, we're going to this other fucking bar to keep drinking. And I was like, well, I'll see you there. Right. On the way to the other bar, I got pulled over by a fucking cop. <laughs> Right? Uh -huh. And the cop's like, uh, you've been drinking? I go, fuck yeah, I work over at this fucking club right here. I, you know, I get paid to drink, basically. So, right. yeah, I definitely smell like booze. But let's do a, the sobriety test thing, you know? Uh -huh. And we do the sobriety test after I fucking been drinking with Zito all night long, like the mother, you know? Right. And then I and then he lets me out. He just get the fuck out of here. You're not drunk, obviously. And I, I, I don't know how much I had to drink at that sure. point. And then I went and drank more <laughs> with the bartenders afterwards, That's right? Angry. And it's just like fucking alcoholic, man. Yeah. It just wouldn't affect me. I yeah. mean, it would affect me, right? I'm like, who's? I'm full of shit. But uh, but yeah, you like you could just drink forever once well, you start down that path well, you of being learn, an alcoholic. Yeah. You learn you learn to operate. Yeah. That way, like I I can't. I don't know how. Like I really. And, it, it, and it's not even just like, like, you know, friends will exaggerate stuff um, because it makes the story cooler. You know what I'm saying? I have my parents telling me how much I used to drink. Yeah. You know, and like my dad, like I remember and then tell me the story and I'm like, wow, I don't remember that at all. You know, and it's like, what was I drinking? Well, you started with this and you went this, 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 and this. Oh, and by the way, I was 17, you know, 18. And it's like, there's how, no, I shouldn't be alive. I, there's no fucking way that that should happen anymore. Like, that, that, there's no way. Yeah. But back then, completely normal. I graduated high school drunk out of my ass. I don't know how the fuck I did that. You know, I, because I, okay, so the band I was in in New York, like, at 16, 17 years old, we played a lot, and we were really big in New York, right? We were po very popular. So I was out every fucking night. If I wasn't playing, I was just at a bar and drinking or a guest of somebody and stuff like that. It was four or five nights a week just being drunk off my ass and then waking up at 6 o'clock in the morning to go to high school to finish it off because I knew I had to graduate so I can That's fucking so great. Yeah, keep playing. So I don't know. I tell my kids all the time, I was like, here's how not to live like a teenager. Don't do what dad did. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that is the truth right there, man. Yeah. It's a... Uh... I learned a lot of what not to do growing mm -hmm. up. No. Yeah. <laughs> There's a big old fucking list of what not to do right. in life. And the funny thing is, like, do you find yourself being judgmental to other people? Because I do. I um, I find so now we're you know we're getting into a little deeper thing, right? I do see my my ego can be judgmental towards people. I don't like to listen to it all that often. Right. Um, 
I try uh, really hard to find the compassion in myself for other people, it, yeah. especially when they're not uh, in the same place in their journey as I'm in. Right. right? And so I've uh, I've had my own fair share of problems, and I've I found myself. Um, doing real dumb shit growing up and uh, now I don't do that shit but that doesn't mean that I'm better than the people that do the shit I used to do right right but uh but yeah my brain likes to pretend like it oh well we don't, we're better than that person now yeah. right that's the that's the thought that I I observe in I, my in my that's consciousness that's the curse yeah. that's the curse of being a human is that I, I'm very like I will admit I'm a judgmental motherfucker like, yeah. I really am um and I'll look at people and I'll be like, look at that guy, he's a fucking drunk. Like, what a piece of shit. And then I'm like, that was you 20 years yeah. ago. And the difference is, is that he's 20 years younger than you right now. You know, and I had to catch myself and be like, what the hell did you know when you were 25? Not Nothing. much, you know? So I'm trying not to do that. Yeah. But it's getting harder. As I, I'm totally going to be the guy, you know, get off my lawn. That yeah. is going to be me. I can't wait to be that guy. Pa practice compassion, my friend. It's, I tried. Uh, it's a very hard thing to practice because people are fucking morons. They don't deserve compassion. They don't deserve time. it. Thank you so much. They don't deserve it. That's that's the what's hard about it, right? right? But those fucking, you know, it, it's it's for you, man. Yeah. It's not for them. I guess so. It's for you. You have to be compassionate to others for your own peace of mind. Yeah. So that you're not sitting there in your own tormented brain <laughs> going, these fucking people, you know, and they'll drive you crazy. Oh, yeah. They'll drive you crazy. You oh, just go, will. and instead of just, you know, you got to be a little bit more like um, understanding of their plight. Right. Everyone has their own suffering that they're dealing with. Yeah, I know. I think I'm just too, I don't even know what the word is anymore. I, I'm not necessarily a, a, a misogynist. Yeah. But I kind of like watching people fuck up. I don't like. I, I, I agree. Yeah. I think I'm a misogynist it in a way. Fun. Like what Joe Rogan says. Yeah. Like, if I see a sign that says dudes blowing donkeys, I'm going in. Well, Definitely. That's, that's the type of misogyny I can admit to. Yeah. Um, but I can also see shit coming. Like, I don't know how many times I've said to, to Stephanie, you know, like about a relationship, let's say, but like, yeah, that ain't going to fucking last. Like, that's got three weeks. Yeah. Max. <laughs> and then it happens. She's like, how do you know? Like, I can see signs. Yeah. Like, I can totally fucking tell, you know? It's like, every time one of her friends gets a boyfriend, I'm like, okay, I'll give that a month. Yeah. Why? Because she makes bad fucking decisions. That's why, you know? Well, every guy she's... I said, okay, so if every guy she's with does something stupid... She's the problem. Yeah. She has shitty taste. You know. Hopefully, she's not watching this. <laughs> hey, man. Sometimes people you need to hear that shit. You know. It is. I think I've told her too. So yeah. Okay. Most of the time, uh, if there's a problem in your life, it, it's because of you. Yeah, exactly. It's definitely a you problem. I, yeah. That's my favorite saying all the time. That's a me problem. Like, because yeah. I will admit, and I couldn't do that for a long time. I, for a long time, it's, I used to tell people, "I'm never wrong, but I'm not always right." Yeah. And there's a huge difference. To be wrong means that you're doing stuff for a wrong reason. To be not right means you had good intentions. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So I'll be not right a lot, but yeah. I'm never wrong. And it took me a long time to like admit defeat and be like, okay, yeah, I fucked that one up. Let's yeah. try something differently now. Yeah. You know? Now there's a lot of uh, power in apologizing mm -hmm. uh, for you know being ignorant and fucking up. Yeah. You, know, you just go, I, I didn't know any better, or I did know better, and I I, I, I did it anyways, kind of thing. Like uh, right. losing your temper is a great example of that. <laughs> Guilty of that. You know, too. and you, all of a sudden you're kind of lost in that, right? And you do yeah. dumb shit and you say mean things that you don't really fucking, or maybe you know, there's somewhere inside of you that does feel that way. But it, even feelings have this uh, this spectrum to them where it's like. Ah, you yeah. know, I don't need to say this horrible fucking thought that came past my mind. Do I? I don't really feel that way about those people, but you get so pissed. Yeah. You get so mad. You're like, what's the meanest thing I've ever thought of? Dude, right? I right? Got, and I'm going to pull that out of the bag and I got throw that, it in your fucking face. Cause, I got that Sicilian tongue. I will yeah. I will find something that will fucking kill your soul. Yeah. You know, I basically will shit on your heart. Like, and that I hate that about myself because I yeah. do that to people I love. And it's like, like, oh, man, like the one thing I probably shouldn't have said. And I, I don't know it as soon as I say it. I'm like... Fuck. But then, because I'm also such a goddamn thick-headed son of a bitch, yeah. I'll keep going. Yeah, it's like if I problem. If I bury that <laughs> with more shit, we'll be okay, you know? <laughs> that's where the... Uh that's where the strength really comes in from the apology. You, yeah. If you can catch yourself fast enough, you go, fuck, I'm, right. I'm... Let me just apologize right now. Yeah. You know, as opposed to... Because I'll do the same thing. I'll just be like, nah, I'd, I'm so pissed. I'm not going to admit that I'm wrong about this, even though I know I'm fucking wrong about right. it. Right. Right? Even in the moment, there's a voice in the back of my head going, you're fucking fucking up, man. 
you know, and I just go, shut up. Right. Fuck these people, and I'm burning the whole world down, right? That's it. Scorch it. Yeah, scorch the That's earth, man. You you're going to go you, down, go down to fucking flames. And you're just lost. You're yeah. lost in your own head and your own emotion. Your ego's taking control of your fucking, uh, of the body, yeah. and it's making the decisions, and you go, fuck. And if you can just get, I get good at apologizing and admitting that you have that weakness in you, it, you can shut that down faster, right. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and immediately go to like the, I do, up, 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 up. Yeah. don't, don't keep fanning the flame. Right. And, I, and it feels good to fan the flame too. Oh, it does. You know, once it's going, mm -hmm. I just want to get fucking even more mad and I want to feed into the anger all, yep. all as much as I can. And, uh, yeah, that's one of the things I've been practicing. I got pissed the other day over some bullshit password stuff online, you know? Like, they're making me change my fucking passwords. And I was so fucking mad about that. Right. And I'm, I was yelling in my own house. That's you me. Just, you know, over, uh, over some fucking password stuff on my computer. Mm -hmm. And I realized after I fixed it, you know, it's just like I had to apologize to, to Angela, right. who was in the same space as me. And I'm fucking her energy all up. Yeah. Because I can't control my emotions. And I feed into See, the anger and I react to things. It took me a long time to get to that point, too. And I, I do that now. But, like, I also tell, like, Stephanie, if you hear me going off, let me go. Yeah. Because it gets worse when I don't let it out. You know, it's like it becomes this huge explosion. Yeah. I always say, like, think of it as like, you know, l like a like a pressure cooker. Let let it out little by little. It's going to be okay. If you pop that sucker open, there's going to be yeah. spaghetti on the ceiling. You know, and I, I tell her, like, let me just kind of, let, let me baste in it for a little while. Let me curse because I, you know, I get colorful. Yeah. Uh, I can, you know, I, I can find a million ways to tell a coffee pot that its mother's a whore. Like, I will just do that, <laughs> you know, and then. After like 20 minutes, I'm fine. I'm like, okay, I feel better now. Yeah. I'm sorry. And like I said, same thing. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to fuck up your energy, but you know, I had to do that. Because if I didn't, a day later, I'm going to explode over something stupid. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's, a, that's the me problem that I talk about. Yeah. And some of the books I read um, about it, it's, uh, they call it watering, uh, watering your, your seeds of consciousness. Mm. And, Sounds uh, too hippie for me. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's, it's Buddhist stuff, man. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, you have all these different uh, seeds in you. You know, seeds of happiness and seeds of anger and seeds right. of doubt. And 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 they talk about how um, the more you water those seeds, the more it becomes a part of what you present to the world, what grows out of you, right? right. And, and um, if your seeds of anger get used to being watered all the time, they're more prone to come out constantly. And that makes uh, sense. And uh, and same for the others, right? If you're constantly watering the good stuff, right. you know, and, and feeding into that energy uh, with intention, mm. uh, it, it really helps. Uh, and, but anger's a, a really good point on that because you can you can see it happen. Right. You can see it happen out of your own control even. Yeah. Where the other ones you kind of have to work on. Right. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a. Um, it's a practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a practice. You can't you can't know something and it just changes you, right? You got no, yeah, you have you, to. You, you're aware of it, and then you have to put in the effort and practice it every day. Yeah, you got to. Uh, there's a self awareness that comes with fuck everything. Like I know, a great example, um, you know, using music as an example, which I you do a lot. So I hope you don't mind that. No. But uh, I've always said to people, you know, I'm a control freak, and I know I'm a control freak, and. One of the reasons why I stopped doing original music was because I could never find people that wanted to work with me because I had to control every fucking aspect of what was going on. Yeah. And it took me until I was, you know, 40 years old to go, okay, that's my problem. You know, it's not them. Why would I, you know, I remember saying to myself, would you want to be in a band with a guy that decides he's going to tell you what to play? He's going to tell you how to play. He's going to tell you what equipment you need. You know, and I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. So now I had to find the happy medium, though, because you can't just break out of that. So, like, with this band that I'm now in, and, and the recording and the writing, it goes differently. It's now, it's like, instead of me trying to control everything, it's kind of like, I'm going to do what I do, and I'm going to help you with your stuff. You know? That's going to that's gonna work for me. If I come into the band with a song, it's pretty much done. You know, I want you to add your part to it, but this is the lyric, the melody, this is how it's going to play, and this is it. It used to be, if you came to me with a song, I would be like, no, I got this one, go learn this. Yeah. Now it's like, okay, let me see if I can help you. you yeah. know? I didn't do that for a long time. Um, and that's just because of you know, reasons of, of being a scatterbrain. And also, and also uh, we all hear things differently. Like we say, you know, I hear entire songs in my head. And it's really hard for me to tell people, play this note. Because it doesn't sound like the way I hear it in my head. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know? yeah. um, 
So I try to do that in my life too now. I don't have to be right all the time. And I can help you. Yeah. And it's not taking anything away from me. It's not making me less of a person. And that, that took a long time. You know, so I'm proud of that, I guess, in a way. Yeah. You know, like I can look at, you know, the uh, the liner notes of, of, of this record and go, yeah, there's other people's names on that, not just mine. Because that got annoying for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I, I did this record with my friend Dominic. And by the way, his name's on everything. And it's like, oh, yeah, look, you know, Joe played Triangle. There I am. Yeah. You know, now it's like, no, this is more collaborative. So I feel good about that. You know? It's good to be collaborative. A lot of times we like to do um, everybody gets full credit for all the songs on the record. Mm -hmm. Right. Like yeah. uh, that was how we were doing it with the last few records. And I, and I think go, moving forward, I think that's how I'll, I'll always do it, which is um, just uh, even split across the board when we're yeah. writing together. Even if, um, you know, say the drummer's just like, we're bringing it to the table and we kind of have the rhythm of the song together, right. but, but he's putting his feel to it, you know? And I'm, um, I think it's, it's one of those things where it's like that song wouldn't be the song right. if he didn't go hit the splash symbol on that one point, right? right? No, it's, I agree. It's it's one of those weird things, right? That that, that when you're writing with other people, yeah. right? How much credit do you give them? See, and that's the like I and I'm I might be a little like I don't disagree, but I disagree. Um, yeah. Not, not to bore people, but uh, you know, the I've seen this and it's happened to me also. Um, if you ever notice, like like take like a, a band's first album, and it, it could be almost anyone that me and you have grown up with. Yeah. Like take take Appetite for Destruction, good example. If you have the the original album, it says all songs written by Guns N' Roses. Yeah. Why did that stop after the second album? Okay. Well, what happens is money gets involved. Yeah. That's number one. Eventually, somebody sits there and goes, "Wait a minute, I wrote, you know, the majority of this song." And this guy played the drum beat and did nothing else, and I had to give him 25%, you know, yeah. something like that. So I wanted to nip that in the bud, you know, like when, when, when Wiki Garden got signed and we were lucky enough to get all our own publishing, uh, the deal I worked out with the guys was like, here's the deal. The guy that writes it gets it, yeah. but everybody publishes it. So, like, I think five of the songs in the record I wrote completely by myself. So I get 100% of the songwriting, but I gave up 75% of the publishing. They each get 25%. Yeah. So this way, everybody's getting a piece of something, you know? Yeah. But I'm not giving away that, you know, what's well, all an even split now because now it doesn't seem like an issue now. And it, because we're older, it probably won't be an issue. But when you're 20 and 10 years from now, all of a sudden, you know, fucking Michelob wants to put your song in a commercial and they want to pay you $50,000 and you haven't talked to the bass player in 10 fucking years yeah. do you want to give that guy 25% <laughs> yeah know? so yeah. like I said if you could do that uh, more power to you like I, yeah. I'm, I just you know I got burned with that shit years ago um, and I because I used to do stuff like that you know and I've had situations where I've made pretty substantial contributions to people and then watch them get it wasn't always money. Sometimes it was just some other form of notoriety. And I'm like, hey, dude, I fucking helped you with that shit. Like, yeah. I did most of the work there. So it's kind of like, I got my stuff, you got your stuff. Like, that, I just think it works easier for me. Yeah, yeah. And I totally agree with that. And that's where it comes into play, right? Where uh, where we go, let's not quarrel right. about it. Uh, maybe between each other, let's just say we don't expect to make any money on it and we can all take credit. Right, yeah. it, When it comes down to it is like, how much money have I ever really made selling records? Exactly. It's not much. It's not. It's not. It's not worth it to fight with people over in the middle of it and like make, like, uh, I like the, that there's, we just don't think about it, right? Yeah. We're just writing music now and it's like, Fuck all the money that we're not going to make anyways, right. dude. I'm making more money now sucks, in publishing true. than I ever made in my life, and it's still, oh, yeah? and it's nothing, and it's funny. Um, like I think the biggest check I got from BMI so far from this record was like fifty bucks. Yeah, and that's money though. Yeah, and I'm like, it took me twenty years to get to a point where I make fifty bucks. Yeah, and when I, it's, so here's the funny thing. So my first record, which came out in 1991, sold maybe like a thousand copies, if we're lucky. And maybe got played a total of like 500 times total, right? I have a record now that sold about 500 copies, give or take, and we got we've gotten played almost a million times, and I am not making shit. Yeah, and it's funny because it's like if you would have told me 25 years ago, someday you're going to make a record that a million people are going to listen to, I would have been like, holy shit, what kind of car am I buying? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, Dang. like it's it like I and. The sad thing is, is that a lot of the people that are music fans don't realize that, 
and they live in this fantasy world that MTV created 30 years ago that everybody that puts a record out is a fucking millionaire. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like we had a song go, you know, and it charted in fucking Australia, and it, then it charted in France, and I was like, "How's this fucking how? Like, this is pretty cool. Like, I wanted this my whole life, and there's nothing that comes of it. It's like, hey, you got a little certificate that says you were the number one fucking band on, you know, whatever, you know, KFRNK. Oh, great. What does that mean? Well, nothing, but you got the certificate. Yeah. And then I literally have people that like message me or call me, and they're like, "So, dude, like, what are you gonna do? Like, you gonna buy a new car? I'm like. No, I have a fucking Toyota. That's all I'm gonna get because I ain't making shit off of this. You know, they don't realize like you know a million Spotify streams pays you like I don't know a thousand dollars if you're lucky. You know, and you got to split that four fucking ways. Yeah, you know, so it's scary, but it's fun. <laughs> de yeah, definitely can't be uh, expecting to make a lot of m money off of album sales anymore. Oh no, definitely fucking, not. It, that whole well, nobody that buys whole anything. Thing's been destroyed. Yeah, they don't buy them to begin with. Yeah, and like we've been lucky where some people you know we, we made it, we made CD copies. And we also did the digital stuff. We've sold a bunch of digital stuff. We've actually sold a bunch of the CD copies, which blew my mind because I didn't expect it. I, like I said, when we signed to this label, he was very realistic. You know, Dave's been around a long time. And he said, if you guys move 500 copies, you're going to sell more records than 99% of everybody that puts out a record. Yeah. And I was like, when you put it in that way, yeah, well, that's, it's doable, right? No, it's fucking hard, especially when nobody buys records. Yeah. We've been lucky because of having worldwide distribution, and we have a label that is prevalent in Europe. So we're on 20th Century Records in Europe. So in Europe and Asia, they buy CDs still. You know, In America, it's kind of like a forgotten thing, but they still buy shit. So we ship a lot out there, and we've had like Amazon refilled like four times at this point. So that's been really cool. Um, but it's also like when you put it in the grand scheme of – how many times it's been listened to and how many people individually that have probably listened to it and you sit there and go, man, when I was a kid, if I heard a good song, I ran to the fucking record store and bought it instantly. Heard it once, boom, I'm going to go buy the whole album. And if the whole album sucks, all right, I'm out 10 bucks. Yep. It's not like that anymore. And it's, it's, it sucks, but it's also, you know, understandable. Yeah. How, much, how many albums do we get suckered into buying from hearing one good song? Well, <laughs> and, uh, I, I know a, a lot of bands aren't uh, interested in putting full albums out anymore. Yeah. They're just doing the single thing mm -hmm. or they'll do like a little short, you know, like uh, three song EP. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and that's making more money for them ultimately sure. because they're putting the album out and they're spending all this production time making, say, 10 songs mm -hmm. and selling the whole album for 10 bucks or they sell the singles at $1.29 a piece yep. and the production costs are way down and they're just, everybody just wants the fucking single anyways. Right, yeah. So ultimately, they're, they make more money just doing the one song. They do. And, they, and you know, we, we thought about, like, we put out an EP before the album, but that was, you know, the label's idea. And... They did it old school the way it used to be. You'd put out a single or an EP to get people to want to buy the whole record. Yeah. Um, we're getting ready to, well, hopefully when all this fucking shit ends, we can record the second album and the discussion's already started. What are we doing? Are we doing an, an EP? And we all want to do another album full length, but we'll probably put out an EP first. And, and the reason why is because the album, it represents a period in your life. You know, it represents a period in that band's life and they tell a story. It's not necessarily a concept album. It's not Tommy. Yeah. But it, it, tells you know at this particular point in time this is what was going on the new stuff that we've been writing compared to the other stuff is a lot darker um not necessarily heavier but darker the you know thematically because we had a lot of shit go on yeah you know, like in in the let's say three years that it's taken that album to be written and then released to go to this one we've had divorces and 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 family members dying and losing you know jobs and uh sicknesses and stuff like that and all that comes through and sometimes it doesn't always come through in two or three songs. Sometimes you need 10 to 12. Yeah. You know? And there's going to be filler on it. There always is. On, on the other record, there's two or three songs where I sit there and go, man, that's just, mm, yeah, that's filler. I, I like the song, but it's just never going to do anything. And it's hard. Yeah, I always, I always try to cut the album down to 10 songs. The, 10 songs is the sweet spot. Yeah. You know? It's the it's, sweet spot. 10, you know, maybe 11 or 12. When I see a 15-song fucking CD, and I'm like, dude, trying way too hard. Yeah. You know? I don't know why you need that much. You're spending money recording and mixing those songs yep. that could be on another album. And uh, are those? Is, are you really giving your best to the other songs on that record exactly. at that point, right? Exactly. If you, Especially when they get into these opuses. Yeah. It's like, oh, we got 12 songs on the record and five of them are nine minutes long. It's like, all right, like they can't all be Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. You know, yeah. like you're going to have to cut some of those. Things. I mean, we did that too. We had a couple songs that we cut 
and it wasn't that much, like 15 to 20 seconds off because we felt they were too long. You know, I, I operate on that general that Gen X thing where everybody's got 15 seconds and then they're, they, they're not interested anymore. That's how you it know? is. Like my songs, it's funny, if you look at the songs I wrote on the record, they all hit the chorus within 45 seconds. I don't want to waste fucking time. It's like, it comes in, there's a 10 second intro, there's a verse, by the time that little counter gets to 45, here comes the chorus. Yeah. You have a minute to decide whether you want to listen to the rest of the song. Yeah, get <laughs> you know? people to that hook. Yeah, that's it, I can't, and because and that's how I am too. You know, like when I listen to songs and I'm like, okay, we're still on the intro, all right, I'm done, click, you know, because again, being scatterbrained, you know. Yeah, oh man, you, what, you don't want like 45 seconds of ominous keyboards droning one note? <sighs> No, I really don't. I, and even back in the day, the I never smoke, did. Smoke going over. Yeah, no. no. Nothing like that? No. I just, I mean, I'm not going to knock bands that do it. Like, there are bands that can pull that shit off and, uh, and, and keep, your, you know, keep you interested. Yeah. I, I just can't, you know? I mean, I remember seeing, uh, who the hell was it? Um, fuck, I think it was uh, like the Allman Brothers. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely the Allman Brothers one time. And I, I liked them, but I was never huge into them. And I remember them coming out, and they just started jamming. And it wasn't a song. It was literally they just came out. The first song of the night was them jamming for like 15 minutes. There was three guitar solos. Then Greg was doing his keyboard shit. The drummer was going nuts. They had a pan flute guy doing shit. And then they're like, okay, now we're all done. Okay, now we're going to do Melissa. Like, and I remember, like, how the fuck did you just pull that off? Because mm -hmm. after, like, three minutes, I would have walked the fuck out of any other band. You know, I don't want to hear that shit, you know? So I guess why I never get into the, you know, get into the Grateful Dead and They're shit. They're talented, man. Yeah. Grateful Dead record. records are crazy, man. I like listening to them play live. Like, I don't even think they have any fucking idea what's happening. No, You definitely. know, like, it's, it, it's not even, it's a jam, right? But then it's, like, so fucking far off from each other, but it works somehow. Yeah. It's it's some crazy it's like shit fish. when the Grateful Dead do it, yeah. yeah same thing with but at fish. least fish does it. It's like there's some structure to that motherfucker. <laughs> fucking Grateful Dead's just so off in the fucking left field. That's what all the drugs did, apparently. Yeah, I guess so. I couldn't do it. Maybe that's maybe that's why I can't do the shit. I never did drugs. Like, I never, never did, never did hard, drugs. No. no, I smoked pot like three times in my life, and I fucking hated it. Yeah, and uh, that's it. Never did fucking coke. I never did acid. Never did anything. And um, I, I think that's maybe why I don't get into certain stuff like that. Yeah. But I remember also, like, I ne here's what I never understood. When people used to go to shows back in, you know, the 80s and 90s, and they would brag about how fucked up they were. Yeah. You know, like, oh, man, I went to see, you know, fucking Pink Floyd last night. Oh, I smoked, like, three bowls and I dropped acid. How was the show? I don't remember. Well, then why the fuck did you go? Like, yeah. you could have did all that shit at home, you yeah. know? And like, oh, you don't understand it's the experience, but you don't remember the experience. Yeah. That's not an experience. <laughs> I don't understand how people can fucking drop acid and tell you they don't remember the experience. Right. I take fucking acid. <laughs> you remember I everything? remember every second of that six to eight hours. You know what I mean? Like, I fucking is, tell you everything that really happened. That, see, six to eight hours, I couldn't. There's no way. Yeah, it's I amazing. Fucking do it. That's why it's called a trip. I guess so. You're going on a trip, baby. Couldn't do it. Oh, dude, it's it's one of the most uh, amazing experiences you'll ever have in your life. That's for damn sure. Yeah, you see, no, I, I think what, it is. I, I very much encourage psychedelics. I, I think, I it's, think it's because for people. But remember, I'm a control freak. Yeah, you it have would to mean I'm, control. I'm out of control, and yes. I don't like that. I can't do that. You cannot have. You can't be in control of shit when you're on acid. Uh -huh. you, and then, and not only that, right? It hyperactivates your fucking brain and your awareness of things, right? Right. So you really become aware of how much you have no control oh, over hell, yeah. anything. Pretty sounds awful. Yeah. Like, I, <laughs> I was laughing the last time. Um, like, I just had my, my birthday of, uh, a week ago or whatever. So I right. fucking, you know, I went down the rabbit hole pretty heavy. And I was coming back. And my brain started, like, my ego started kicking back in a little. You know, you know acting all mighty and... Mighty and tough and, and powerful like it thinks it is. Right. And I was just laughing at it in the background like, look at this motherfucker. <laughs> you know, like, uh, who the fuck does he think he is? Like, he's in charge of anything in this existence, you know? And, <laughs> and I just see my fucking brain coming back online like... Uh, right. Immediately acting like uh, it was all, all high and mighty and it had shit under control. And he's just yeah. like, you don't. No, we don't like at all. The world's just... 
It's like you might as well be fucking lost in the ocean on a life raft. You know, you ain't going to be able to steer that thing in one direction yeah. or the other. The current's going to take you, and life it. is doing the same thing to you, my friend. Nope. Just because nope. this shit feels all solid and stuff, uh-huh. we're still in the stream, man. Nope. I'm off. I'm going off the boat right now. I even, yeah. like, I would be that guy that, like, dropped acid and ends up, like, cutting his own arm off and then, like, goes to the hospital and, like, Chrissy mm-hmm. tried to sew it back on, you know? Like, like did you ever read that, like, the story about that guy in Florida who, like, turned himself in because he was high on meth and he killed his imaginary friend? Like, That's that awesome. would, yeah, that would be me. Yeah. You know, because I can't, absolutely could not lose control. Like, no yeah. way. I have to be completely in control. Yeah, it's one of those things where you have to, like, dive back into it. Like, yeah. a, it's, it's like a warm pool, you know? You just, like, fucking fall back and let it take you. <laughs> Boom. It's, uh, it's not going to, um, that's where people have those experiences where they call them bad trips. Right, yeah. And I think those are the most uh, important trips for people where really? they have the bad ones. Yeah, where they, they – because what's happening is there's a conflict of reality, right? Mm-hmm. Like um, it's going to present the world to you in a new way, and it's going to tear down all these walls that's, that have been built up inside of your mind, right? So you, as you grow up – Right, and as you uh, evolve into this version of yourself that you currently are, right. all these um, defense mechanisms have, have been built inside of your subconscious. You're not aware of them, you know what I mean? Yeah. You just do them sometimes, and like, um, and and taking the uh, the psychedelics makes you very much aware of them because it decimates them. Right, it, they're gone, right. and all of a sudden you're just super exposed to all thought, and. Uh, and you have to deal with those things, right? Like it's, it's like I said, they're they're sub self conscious uh, subconscious defense mechanisms that right. uh, basically they prevent you from dealing with things. A lot of people drink real heavily, right, to like black out or yeah. just not feel things, and your mind starts getting into that pattern of like, let's just do that with bad feelings. Mm-hmm. And that fucking acid pulls them all out, mm-hmm. puts them right in front of you, and you have to deal with them. Like, yeah, and it's brutal. And uh, uh, it's one of the most important things, like. Uh, you can really do to fucking awaken your third eye real big, mm. wide wide open. I have to keep my third eye as close as possible. Yeah. <laughs> you realize, yeah, it's a uh, it's a lot of fun, man. I always encourage people to uh, to take a mushroom or two, right? Just to start. Oh you know? man, I can't now. I'm good. Let, yeah, I'm let good. it all go. That's what you, especially at this age now. Nobody wants to see a forty five year old fucking guy tripping. You don't trip for someone else, man. I'm just saying, like, yeah. like, even the story would be awful. You know, like, what did would you it? do? Oh, I dreamt that my portfolio was doing bad. Like, I don't fucking, like, the yeah. hell would it be? Like, I don't, you know, no, could do it. I don't know. It's, uh, it's more therapy than people th- uh, tend to realize. Uh-huh. They think it's a party drug. That's what happened to me. I just wanted to fucking party. And right. so I was just fucking, I would just take all kinds of shit. Yeah. And I started taking all the psychedelics and, and all of a sudden now, it, you know, I've, fucking haven't drank or smoked cigarettes or done any like like white powder substance you know no right. cocaine or anything like that it's like almost a decade man you know wow. like it just makes you go what the fuck are you doing man? Right. what the fuck is that you know why would you do that to yourself and uh uh because like i said it puts it, all those all those lies you were telling yourself like this behavior's okay you yeah. know to just fucking drink uncontrollably mm-hmm. and smoke cigarettes and and just fucking you know rage into the night you lie to yourself and you just go, no, this is normal. Yeah. This is okay. I guess. And then you take a real heavy dose and you reflect on that mm. and you go, what the fuck? Why would I do that to myself? Right. You know, you just go, man, <laughs> I just imbibe this poison. And just, you know, you become this, uh, yeah. this greater self. Right. You, you become self-reflective. The, yeah. And, I, maybe and that, self-aware. Maybe that's why I don't want to do it. Maybe yeah. I don't want to reflect on myself because yeah. I know I made, like I made bad decisions, but you know, it's like. I keep saying I'm going to quit smoking. I've been doing that for 10 years, you so, know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I quit, and then I go back, and I quit, and I go back, and I always go back for the wrong reasons. And not that there's a right reason, but um, I never go back because I'm jonesing for a cigarette. It's really weird. I never go back because I have, like, you know, the uh, that that addictive withdrawal. I don't get that. I get I get the withdrawal from coffee. I don't get withdrawal from cigarettes. Yeah, because caffeine's super addictive. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm, I'm That's totally, a powerful I, drug. I am a junkie when it comes to coffee. I drink like 20 yeah. cups of coffee a day. Because it's a drug. Yeah. And it, but yeah, people when, don't like to admit that. No, but it totally is. I quit yeah. I quit coffee a couple months ago, and I was yeah. I almost killed my whole family. It hurts. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I quit caffeine all the time, and it fucking hurts. Yeah. But cigarettes, I'll throw them out, and I'll go, I'm not smoking anymore. And I'll go di- I, I had yeah. my wisdom teeth taken out last month, right? Yeah. So I couldn't smoke for like four or five days because of the, the dry socket thing that they say you can get. 
you would think like like a normal person would sit there and go, all right, well now you just quit because I didn't Jones at all. I was fine. Like you know, my fiance was like, do you want a cigarette? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm actually good. You know, why did I start smoking again? Well, because I looked in the mirror and went, man, I'm starting to get fat again. Oh man, I started. I ate too much yesterday. Yeah. And that's like, because as soon as I quit smoking, I gain weight. Yeah. And um, or. You know, I quit smoking, everything's good, and then I get really stressed out. And when I get stressed out, I usually want to drink, but I don't want to be a drunk anymore. Yeah. And even though it's been literally 20 years since I've been a fucking drunk, um, and I know I can casually drink and knock it out of control, I don't want my kids seeing me reaching for a bottle. Even good though they're, man. yeah, you know, so I go outside and have a cigarette. And I don't smoke a lot, I smoke like half a pack a day. Um, not that it's, you know, any better than anything else. But it's because of that reason. It's 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 never for a good reason. It's never for an addiction of, of physicality. It's the addiction of, I'm going to do something stupid if I don't do this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to get fat, or I'm going to get drunk, or I'm going to get fat and drunk. Like one of you know. Yeah. So, I'll stick with my Marlboros. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where, uh, where discipline becomes a big part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been really diving into the discipline thing a lot lately and uh trying to wake up still even with the the coronavirus we still go to bed at 10 right, and yeah. fucking wake up early <laughs> and um i try to meditate in the morning and mm-hmm. uh try to exercise wait till noon to eat you right. know that kind of shit eat yeah. real healthy and um and it sounds like it sucks you know like it's it, all these things but they add up to like this great overall feeling of well-being whenever you're constantly like it's not it's not about control either it's about um i don't know what the right word would be but uh but like the discipline things about um you know just giving into what you should be doing with your time as opposed to what you feel like doing with your time right right and that's a control thing too yeah maybe you maybe you don't have all day to fuck around you know maybe Maybe having two or three hours in a day to do whatever you feel like, play a video game or watch a TV show and, mm. you know, yeah, that kind of thing. Maybe that's all you really get because most of the time where you should be taking care of yourself. Right. And um, doing the exercise, doing the meditation, brushing your teeth at night, eating healthy, you know, making like all these things that you, it takes a lot to take care of these human bodies. Yeah. And uh, I think most of us it, it just ignore it. Go, fuck it. You know, yeah. well, I know I do. And they uh, they get you get used to it too growing up because it just took care of itself for so long. Right. right. Like all the way up till I was about 30 years old. I do pretty much whatever the fuck I wanted. Right. My body was great. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just fucking great. Like it didn't matter what I did to myself. Right. Yeah. I could abuse it uh, chemically. I could abuse it physically. And I just bounce back. Mm-hmm. And I and and, you know, you just fall into that. And I think uh, the last the last five years, I just turned 35, have been this big like waking up process of going. um I guess that's not how it fucking works anymore, is no, it? Yeah. Yeah. 35, well, I had my car accident when I was 35 or yeah. 34. And that's, yeah, that's when everything changed. That's when, like, you know, you, you started waking up and it's not like you're making popcorn when you got out of bed. And that's yeah. when, oh, you know, you go out and play softball with your friends and the next morning, like, you're fucking limping, you know? And, yeah, yeah I, I can see that, that it's, 35 is like the magic number. Like, people always, like, we, we give credence to certain birthdays for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Oh, I'm 18. I'm an adult. Great. So what does that mean? Uh, you know, hey, I'm 21. I can drink. Yeah, I've been drinking since I was 16. All right. Hey, you're 30. That's what, what does that mean? Anyway, nothing. No, 35 is fucked up. Like, yeah. Like, you know, because like I said, I'm going to be 45 tomorrow. 45 is used to be old. Now, like, I tell, you know, my fiance, like, I'm 20 in my head. Yeah. It's my body that won't catch up, you know? And I see my father, who's almost 70. And my dad is like the most act. Now he doesn't exercise, and the guys been eating vegetables his whole fucking life. Yeah. But he's the most active person you ever seen in your life. Like, like they're they're in Florida, and they're trapped at home. They can't go anywhere. My father's a diabetic, right? And I call. What are you doing? Ah, I just painted the house yesterday. I'm power washing the lanai. I'm gonna go outside and do change the fucking oil. I think we install a fucking antenna for my neighbor. Like, Sit the fuck down, dude. Like, yeah. you know, like this. And like on top of. Being, you know, a diabetic and 69, he's he's legally disabled because he had massive neck surgery. He's had back surgery. He's, I mean, he was a cop. He'd been shot at. Like, he, if anybody has earned retirement, it's my dad. Yeah. And he just won't stop, like, ever. He's like, no, nah, fuck it. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to go outside and fucking plant shit now. Like, okay. There was an alligator outside. I just chased him with a bat. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Call Jeez. somebody, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I'm watching my old man. He uh, he pushed himself real fucking hard all the way to the very end, man. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's paying for it now. Like uh, like his body was telling him a few years ago, like you're done. Yeah, you're supposed to retire. You right. know, and uh, and he was just like, "Fuck you, 
I'm not retiring. I'm never retiring. Uh-huh. Right. And uh, <laughs> he's just like, that was his, he just, he, he was just so stubborn about it. Yeah. And he just kept pushing himself, but he wasn't taking care of himself either. You know, motherfuckers just sitting around eating ding dongs and shit. <laughs> and, uh, and now it's just like this, uh, now he's just like, I don't know what to fucking do with myself. He retired, but he feels like shit. Right. And like work's not making him get up to go do anything. So he's That's- like. I'm That's just going to fucking, yeah, he's like, I'm just going to lie around and do yeah. a bunch of nothing for a long time. And I'm like over there trying to help him get active again. Right. And eat and drink fucking water. <laughs> drink your water, old man. See, that's, I think it's because my, my father retired at 44. Yeah. So, um, and, and not because he wanted to. I mean, he, you know, he got hurt on the job and, you know, there's not much a, a cop or a correction officer can do after, you know, having major neck surgery, you know? Yeah. Um, but because of that, like, he never allowed himself to. You know, be like, okay, well, I'm retired now, so I can just, you know, live a life of leisure. You know, like my, you know, my parents aren't rich by any stretch of imagination, but they're definitely not poor either. Um, and they, ha- but they have that upbringing because they were born 70 years ago. Uh, what I call like depression upbringing. Their parents, yeah. you know, their parents went through the depression. They were born poor. We were poor for most of my life. You know, the first 10 years of my life. So they still have that in them. So they're not extravagant. They don't spend money on stuff they don't really need. My father would rather you know, buy the twenty dollar table he found on Craigslist and fix it himself than go buy the two hundred hour table and have somebody deliver it. Like that's how my dad is. Yeah. I see myself now at the same age that he was when he retired and I don't have a chance of retiring at this point. And I'll probably never retire. I'm gonna be one of the guys at fucking Walmart, you know, waving people in when he's eighty seven. But it's like I've been home for six weeks now since this thing started and I'm losing my shit. I can't play with my band. I I, I can't what, what can I do? Like I don't there's nothing for me to do yeah you know i'm lucky enough that i'm not hurting financially but i am losing my shit like i said when you called me last night and said hey i had a cancellation when do the show tomorrow. i was like oh fucking thank god i get to get out of the house for two hours yes yes i'll be right there <laughs> i would have came over last night if you called me <laughs> that's how freaking shit you know this. <laughs> that's like a great man yeah. and it's funny because like when i'm leaving today Stephanie's like how long is it gonna be i'm like i don't know i said these things usually last an hour two hours uh, i'll be home by like four four thirty yeah and then she's like, okay, well, um, you, know, we'll, you know, we'll have dinner, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I might come home at 5. And she's like, I'm like, would that be okay? Because I don't even know anymore. Yeah. And I'm like, I guess it would be all right if, I, if it took three hours. I don't know how long it's going to take. You know? <laughs> I just wanted an excuse to get the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. It's nice to get out of the house. Yeah. I, I haven't left the house much uh, during the... Uh during the quarantine and the first at first i did i went and fucking stocked up and right, made yeah. sure i had everything i needed and then i uh then i hunkered down pretty hard mm-hmm. and it was like man we went to the park the other day and that was fucking fantastic just get out of the house and walk around the park a little bit right. it's like i look forward big time to walking the dog yeah um that's like the best part of my day right. it was like let's walk the dog around the fucking block you know right. like the sometimes dog's i'm like, like stop <laughs> yeah like i'm like uh we walk the dog in the morning now you know it's like first thing because it's getting hot and then it's like uh i want to fucking walk the dog again at night like let's get the fuck out of the house right. you know, the sun went back down let's get outside yeah. again you know fuck this shit that's what worries me about like I don't know what this is going back to like and that's yeah. that scares the shit out of me you know I did um I did an interview a couple of weeks ago I don't even think they've even put it out yet but the person was, that that I did the interview with was asking me you know like how is your life and your you know changed and what what are you looking forward to and I'm like I don't know what to look forward to because I don't know how it's coming back I don't know when we can go to a club yeah you know like I don't think it's going to be any sooner than six months from now. You know, with the way they're talking. And it's like, you know, if you take Vance as an example, just because we both know the system, you know, that's a place that holds 200 people. Yeah. You can't tell them they can open up, but you can only have 50 because they can't make money, you know. And if they can, well, more power to them. No. But they can't. No. And if you want to have live music, what are you going to tell the bands? Look, you only want to bring 10 people? Like, how does yeah. that work? So I don't know what, like, so do I want it to open up? Absolutely. I can't wait for this shit to just be done. But I also have no fucking idea what we're coming back to. Yeah. And that scares the shit out of me. To the point where I'm like, we may need to leave the state because I don't know if there's going to be anything left, you know? And, you know, we're a very dependent state on what everybody else is doing. Yeah, and that scares the shit out of me. Yeah, there's no there's no economy here. Without the uh, without yeah. the entertainment industry running, there is no economy. Right. I mean, we're shut down. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, there's no, there's no fucking... 
vegetables to grow. There's, there's no fucking nothing. animals to fucking tend and to. There's no. I mean, I mean, yeah. There's there, there's some mines going on out in the right. Uh, but do you want to go to outskirts? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's not like it's not like that's what the fucking city's based around. And yeah. like that, we're there's there's enough jobs for everybody to survive on that stuff. Those are few and far between. Right. You know? Yeah. We, we need more nickel, so we have people. Yeah. You know, and it worries me, especially at the entertainers. Like, you know, I did a live uh, Facebook live thing just playing guitar just because bored and a friend of mine uh i played a song he's like hey how can i tip you i'm like i don't want to tip like I'm, I'm cool like you don't have to give me money yeah and then i thought about it and i was like wow i mean there are literally people that are out there right now that this is what they see i was lucky in the sense that like you know wiki garden was my job like i have a day job wiki garden is you know it's fun and I never counted on any money for it, but there are people out there right now, like, they're not fucking working, they're not playing, how are they eating, how are they surviving, and that fucking scares me. Yeah. And I feel bad for them. If I feel bad to the point that my manager had wanted me to do a live, a regularly scheduled live acoustic show and hook up a Venmo and stuff like that, and I had her tell her no. And, you know, I got to pay my manager a percentage, yeah. so she's not making money, and I feel bad. But it's like I can't do that to people when there are people that legitimately don't have anything. Yeah. Like I said, I'm lucky enough to be in a, in a good financial situation where I don't have to worry about money right now, where a lot of people don't fucking know what they're doing. And I, for me to go on Facebook to play an acoustic song in front of the 200 people that are going to watch it and beg for $5, to me is fucking insulting to those people. Yeah, you know, That's why I haven't done it, and I, I don't think I could. And it sucks, and it re it really sucks. You know, the funny thing is, is that like like Wicked Garden, we used to always complain about not being able to get booked, and it's true. We had a very hard time, even after the record came out. It got harder after the record came out for us to get booked. And now I'm sitting there going, man, if we thought there was no fucking gigs before this shit, what the fuck are we gonna do? Now? <laughs> it's be rough, man. I mean, I've yeah. completely changed my uh, uh, my whole revenue stream, man. Like mm -hmm. this is this is what I'm doing now. I'm going for the YouTube thing. We're gonna right. be, you know, we're we're looking to start directing like co comedy shorts and, and oh, nice. we're do like some stand up stuff. I I don't know what we're I don't know what's gonna happen with the audio engineering that mm -hmm. I was doing for so long, and yeah. and it's like the the band stuff is just done. You know, it's uh, I don't see them bringing the conventions back anytime soon. Right. Uh, you know, that's fucking bands aren't going to be performing, like you said, for like another six months. So easily. It's like, yeah, yeah I'm I'm totally uh, out of work on in all directions, you know. Right. And uh, and so now I'm a YouTuber. You know, I'm just trying to get them subscribers. Yeah, man. And I hope you do. Like, I, I, I know it's hard. Cause like I said, my son, you know, has a YouTube channel and he's just about the thousand person subscriber that's what you need yeah, yeah to start getting money yeah and um and i see what he the work that he puts it in like that kid he does maybe one video every two weeks uh and he's it's like non-stop like 24 hours straight he's working on shit so i give you a lot of uh props for that oh yeah but i think that the evolution of the people you know i've always said this about vegas and it's got me in trouble you have musicians and you have entertainers or performers it doesn't mean that they can't be both. They can. The problem is that the musicians are going to play regardless. They don't care. Yeah. The performers want to get paid. The entertainers want to get paid. The musician will have a better time of this. You know, if if a, a random shit bar calls me up next week and says, look, we want to try to get live music back in. We can only give you guys 100 bucks to play for the night. We're probably going to do it. Yeah. We don't need the 100 bucks. We're going to take the $100 and give it to our manager. Hey, thank you for working through this. But the performer that's used to getting five hundred dollars a week or a night or whatever the hell it was they were getting, they're gonna have a hard fucking time because that money ain't gonna be there anymore. Oh yeah, you know. And you know, it's funny. I remember I got a lot of flack the first time I ever said that. I, I did a I did an interview right before our record came out and said, "Well, I'm not an entertainer, I'm a musician." There's a huge difference, and I got ripped up one side and down the other. And I'm like, I'm not dissing you. I'm not saying you're not a musician to this particular person. You are. Yeah. But. I can tell you the 12 songs you're going to sing tonight because you've been singing them for 15 years. Yeah. You know, I can tell you what you're going to wear, what you're going to say, how you're going to say it, when you're going to say it, because I've seen your show, and it's never changed, and you're happy with that. Wicked Garden turned down plenty of shows where they asked us to do shit we didn't want to do. Yeah. You know, like, hey, we want you guys to play 80s music. No, we'll go fuck yourself. We're not going to do it. So those people are definitely going to have a hard time. And I think that if those people leave, if the entertainers leave and you stuck with just musicians, you might get some semblance of a, of a local scene back. But if all the musicians leave and just the entertainment stays, I don't think we're coming back. And that's a shitty thing to say because they want, they're going to need to get paid. Not just want, they're going to need to get paid. And 
what a lot of people don't understand because most people have failed economics. I've learned that pretty much in, in my older life is that if this guy isn't making money, he can't pay you. Yeah. You know, if the casino's closed and nobody's playing fucking slot machines, we can't give you $1,000 to sing Wonderwall. That's how that works, you know? Yeah. Now, we were just talking about the whole pay-to-play scenario mm -hmm. coming back really heavily on the last podcast. Yeah. And now it's like, yeah, you're you're kind of stuck with, with situations like that because the venue has to remain uh, mm -hmm. standing. And those people need to be making money yeah. to encourage them to give a shit about paying the bills on those venues. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, selling beer and uh, 10 bucks ahead at the door, it's yeah. not a lot of fucking money when you compare it to thousands of dollars for a power bill. Right. And, uh, you know, the cost of leasing a building, paying all the licensing fees, paying all your employees out, paying the bands, paying right. for booze, paying for kitchen. It's just like, fuck, man. Yeah. That's a very expensive thing. See, I, I wouldn't have a problem. Like, I, I hate pay to play. I wouldn't have a problem with pay to play if it was if it worked like this. We're going to give you, the tickets are $10, whatever you sell, you keep five, and that's it, and it ends there. I wouldn't have a problem with that. The problem that I have with pay-to-play is when they say um, you have ten uh, 100 tickets to sell at $10 each, and if you don't sell them, you got to buy them. Now I have a problem with that, you know? and that just pisses me off because now I'm doing your job. That's why I looked at it. You know, If you tell me, look, if you only sell... 10 tickets for $10 each, you only make 40 bucks. I can live with that because it's like, okay, I didn't do my part, but at least the show's going to get played. We'll sell some merch, blah, blah, blah. We're good. But if you tell me I got to buy your tickets when I'm done, no, now I'm doing your fucking job, and that's yeah. not right. You yeah. Know? yeah. But I can see, I mean, it was already starting to, it was already happening out here, and I can see it being a lot worse. Yeah. And it, it sucks. But the, and, and again, to play devil's advocate at the same time, it's like, well, if you're only paying six people, it's like, I can't pay you $500. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Yes. You absolutely. Know? And, uh, and it's kind of that um, it's kind of that social contract that ends up happening or like a, a literal contract at that point. Right. Where it's like, uh, no, I, you are going to bring people to my club. Right. right. Like we're going to I'm going to hire you and then you're going to bring people to drink for me. Right. Because mm -hmm. that's the fucking deal. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it just incentivizes them to actually do that. Right. As opposed to just go, oh, well, we yeah. got to play our show. Because you get stuck with that a lot. You know, sure. a lot of these bands don't don't put out their fucking, their their legitimate effort on their part. Where no, no, they they're don't. like, you know, they yeah. just show up and their, their parents fucking show up. And it's just like, mm -hmm. oh, were we supposed to, like, tell our friends that we were right. playing a show and, like, get people here? It's like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you well, were. You, it also, you know, you got to also take into account the 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 people that you're hiring um using us as an example you know like we're not young guys we're not you know 25 years old um we're a very good drawing band in certain places yeah if we play vamped every seat will be you know will be reserved and it'll be a, a big night uh if we play the gold mine out in henderson we're going to pack the place we always do but you know we've played shows in other venues and nobody showed up yeah. and it's because they're fans of venues and not bands and um the other issue too is that who are you catering to? You know, most of eight, you know m most of Las Vegas is stuck in the eighties. Those people are fifty and sixty years old now. Yeah. You know, you, yes, you may be able to get fifty of them into the club. Do you really think they're going to drink like they used to when they're twenty? They're not. Um, so you kind of need, and that's the a problem. A lot of the promoters in Las Vegas have had is they don't want to admit that shit has changed. You know. Um, you know, I, I still don't understand why there's some clubs in, in Las Vegas that we have literally played and packed and we never got called back. Yeah. And um, then, you know, like I said, it became the hate fuck for certain clubs. Um, you know, and it's like we uh, the last time we played th that certain place that we were I don't want to badmouth any places, but the, the last time we played that place, um, it was one of those last minute. Hey, we had a cancellation. Can you play on a Thursday? And we played and we brought in almost 100 people on a fucking Thursday and it was like in February and it was cold and it was raining and nobody wanted to leave the house and we brought in almost 100 people and we didn't even get a fucking thank you. Jeez. And then we have been trying to get booked since then and we don't even get a return. You know, why did my, you know, it really pisses me off and, I, and I'm a little bitter but I can be bitter at my age. You know, why did I have to, how come we couldn't get a show for our own record release party in our home fucking city? You know, like that fucking pissed me off. We knew the release date of our record for six months. And we, our manager started contacting all the, the club owners and the promoters that we have worked with over, this band's been around seven, oh God, eight years now. 
we couldn't get one person to call us and say, hey, we want you to have your fucking record release party here. And I'm like, that's fucking insulting. For all the shit that we did, how many times did we play your clubs with, because nobody else would play it, or, you know, you guys were in a pinch, yeah. or we played for less than we normally would because, oh, uh, hey, guys, can you help me out? We've done that a million times. And how many times have I, you know, personally subbed for other people and helped them out so they didn't have to cancel their gigs? I have talked people out of canceling their gigs that my band would have gotten and said, hey, no, I'll go do the show. I'll, pl- I'll sing for you tonight, or I'll play guitar for you tonight. Don't cancel your gigs. That ain't cool, you know? Yeah. And... I ended up having a, you know, my manager had to beg the fucking bunkhouse, a place we never played before, to book us on a Wednesday or something like that, just so we can have a record release party. Jesus. Yeah, that's fucked. That's, that it pissed me off so much. Um, I've went to everybody's record release party, or at least if I couldn't make it, there was always a good reason. And we had a decent amount of people show up. Like I said, on a Wednesday, it was weird, but we had people show up. But it wasn't hundreds of people. It was like maybe 30 or 40. Yeah. And I was like, you know... Then I see the next week or two weeks later, hey, we're having a record release party at this particular club. And I'm like, nobody goes to see you. I've been to your shows. It's me, your girlfriend, and the waitress. That's it. What the fuck are you doing differently? You know, because you play the cool music. Yeah. I don't play cool music. Uh, I play the music that killed metal. Like, no, metal committed suicide. That was the problem, you know? Yeah. Metal shot itself in the face. You know, grunge didn't kill metal. Yeah. That's basically what the, what the issue is. And, you know, you have a bunch of people that are, you know, what well, they say, wannabes, never have beens, never will be's. Um, there's a lot of them. And uh, for some reason, they think they can dictate what's cool still. It's like, dude, sit down. There's a bunch of kids outside that are way cooler than you. Let them in. You know? Yeah. I want to tell those people all the time, please get off the stage and let that kid try something because he's the next whatever it is. I gave up my shit for this kid. You know, like, um, you know, you see bands like uh, Dirt Halo and stuff like that. You know, these, you know they're younger. You know, and they're fucking hungry and they're good. And I will step aside and let one of them, you know, I've given up time in my set for them to play longer, you know, and stuff like that. Like when we did a show at the Bunkhouse or something like that. Not the Bunkhouse, uh, um, the Beauty Bar. We like, gave up like 10 minutes of our sex. They wanted to give the kids like 15 minutes. So, like, no, nah, give them 25. Yeah. It's fucked up, you know. I think it was Dare Halo. I mean, if it's not Dare Halo, it was another band. And I, 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 I confuse bands because I'm old, but it was a younger band. And... I don't see that anymore, and I think that's what's killing everything, kind of. Yeah, you need a you need a thriving local scene, man. Without it, it's just like where do all the fucking musicians come from? You know, they come from that local scene. You can't just keep making celebrity pop stars out of fucking supermodels and right. auto tune them. Yep. Like that's just not a real music industry. Mm-hmm. And uh, without that local scene hanging out and, mm-hmm. and getting support, you know, there's no place for these young kids to thrive and be mm-hmm. creative and, and, and develop the new sound and the new music. You know, if everybody just wants the fucking 80s to stick around forever. Yeah. And it's like I see that a lot, you know, it's a lot where everyone's just like, we're just going to keep recreating that 80s rock and roll thing. Yep. And I don't understand why you would do that like I, I, I get i get why you would play covers of right. 80s and why you would fucking you know but it's like man, it's 2020 there's yeah. so much weird shit happening who's listening to that i get in undated right? with it like i get so much um uh i i don't know and i, I think it, a lot of it has to do with because the label that we're on does a lot of reissues so i get random people that message me and they're like hey i want you to check out my band and it's like okay cool and they'll send it to me and it's like you know three fingers deep and everybody's hair is up to here and they're wearing spandex I'm like what the fuck are you doing yeah number one and first of all you're 40 stop like it's it's stupid and, and like if you like that sound music like fine like i still like listen to cinderella like i like them you know like it's fine some of them have good music but if you're going to have, especially for a local scene, if all you want to do is have what I call the echo chamber circle jerk, yeah, then you like just you're never going to like this is why your scene dies. You know, it's going to die. I remember when a bunch of people boycotted a certain club in town because they had booked a certain type of band. They said, "We're not going there because we're going to stand up and let them know that you know we're '80s." Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, "Guess what? There was a." Fucking, you couldn't move in the place. They didn't need you. Yeah. You think they need you. They don't. They don't. As a club owner or a promoter, you think you think I want a bunch of 50-year-old women with saggy tits and a miniskirt? Not really. No. You know? You want the college kids. <laughs> Absolutely. Spending their college money getting fucking shit-faced. Yeah. You want a guy like me that maybe can drink three beers if he's lucky before he's passing out? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> It's uh, it's true, man. You know, and and you got to diversify your uh, your crowd. You can't expect yeah. the same fucking alcoholics to just keep supporting your establishment, right? right? It's like you want 
to mix that shit up all month long and try to get the a, a nice diversified income from the people in the city you live in, right? Yeah. Not, every, not everybody likes rock and roll, period. Exactly. Right? You, know, not, you know, some people want fucking dubstep. Right. Some people want fucking hip hop, you know, mm-hmm. like. You, you and gotta, if you want to do that. Yeah, you got to change it up. Yeah, well, but change it up, but also like be smart about that. Like yeah. the other thing that drives me crazy about promoters in this town is like, okay, I'm going to book a show. I'm going to have 12 bands on it. Each band's going to play 10 fucking minutes. That's terrible. And it's like, okay, we have a death metal band, then a blues band, then a hip hop band, then a trance band, then we have a punk band. Like, yeah, what that's... The f- yeah. Why do you... And then they complain, like, oh, nobody comes to the shows. Well, there's a reason why. Nobody wants to go to that nobody show. Nobody wants to that. As, and first of all, okay, so first of all, you want me to sell a ticket for $12. I'm going on at 7 o'clock at night or 2 in the morning, one or the other. Yeah. I'm playing for 15 minutes. And people that listen to my band, which is a grungy alternative band, do not want to sit through seven other bands that play death metal, punk, and blues to get to me. Yeah. And the other thing, too, that a lot of promoters don't realize is that every band in town fucking knows each other. They think if I book eight bands and they all bring in 25 people, then I'm going to have, you know, 160. No, no. They all know the same 25 people. Yeah. 25 people are going to show up. That's it. Because they all know each other. <laughs> yeah. And there's only so many people in the fucking music scene. Exactly. You can't just. Yeah. That, that shit drives me nuts. It's like you're just going to. We're just going to slam the bill. Right. To make up for the fact that none of these bands draw. Yeah. Right. And it's like, well, you're still not going to have anybody at your fucking concert. Right. You know, you got a bunch of bands that don't draw. You still have nobody there. It's and uh, and they just think that it's going to change the scenario, and it's like get three bands mm-hmm. that do their homework. Yeah, right. Like just get three good bands that give a fuck, and they're gonna they're going to advertise for you. They're gonna blast the fucking internet. They're gonna f- actually print flyers and put them on people's fucking cars and hand them to people. You know, like. That's we get that. made fun of for doing that still. That's a real way to promote, I like know. that you get more people at a fucking venue by handing out flyers than you do by putting a fucking Facebook, Facebook event page up. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't bring anybody to a fucking concert. Whenever we do, yeah. Back. Whenever we do a gig in town, we go, we go to, uh, we go to Fremont, and we go to like the record stores, and we put up flyers, and then we'll yeah. go down to Fremont, and we'll actually like hang shit up, and. Uh, We've actually gotten made fun of by that. I, well, people make fun of my band all the fucking time because it's just how it is. Um, that's what happens when you put yourself out there. Though. Well, that's yeah, and I expect that. If you you're know? standing on the stage, there's going to be people making fun of Absolutely. you, no matter how good you are, mm-hmm. right? Like people are going to make fun yeah. of you, right? And I welcome it. I'm like, go ahead, just hit me. You know, yeah. I, can, I just keep. I've heard everything a thousand times. You've welcomed it. You, you're yeah. sta- you're, the, you're on stage. You're welcoming it, right? I always say them like, you can make fun of me whatever you want, but I'm standing up here and you're down there. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. That's it. And I got news for you. If you walk away for five minutes and I was a single man, I'd have your girlfriend. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hard to get up on that stage, man. And it's a lot of it's a lot of overcoming fear and mm-hmm. uh, and just putting together a fucking plan. What yeah. are you gonna do when you get up there? Right. right. I mean, it's it's uh, you have to define. Yeah. You have to define a sound. You have to define an image. You know, and it's it, and then it's a lot of work. You, and then you have can't to just walk up there. You, not only do you have to plan all your shit out, like you said, but then you have to deal with the shit. Like no matter what you do is right. You know, I put up a post on Facebook about a year ago because we did a show where we played for four and a half hours straight with no break. Yeah. Right. And somebody that we all know, like, was like, "Why would you do that? I, I would never do that." I'm like, "Well, because we do it because we love it." And we were having a, f- a great time. The, the, the club was great. The people were awesome. People were, you know, having fun. And we sat there at one point and said, if we take a break now, people are going to leave. We don't want people leaving. We're going to play. So we played yeah. for four and a half fucking hours. If you can't play for four hours just because of an ego thing or a money thing, then you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I'm lucky enough. I'm a trained singer. My voice held up for four and a half hours. A lot of people couldn't do that. Um, a lot of people couldn't play for four hours, you know, guitar-wise. We all were able to do it, and I got shit for that. I'm like, you motherfucker, it doesn't matter what we do. If we play for ten minutes, you say we didn't play long enough. If yeah. we have a four and a half hours, we play too fucking long, you yeah. know? Fuck it, we're wrong all the time, which is live with it, you know? But you're always going to be wrong, man. Absolutely. The, then the world we live in is just judgmental pricks everywhere. Fucking guys, right? It's just like, you know, they they want to shit all over everything you do, right. and... They're, a lot of them aren't doing anything themselves, of course, no. right? They would never put themselves in the situation where someone could fucking do the same thing to them. Right. But they're going to shit all over all your hard work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just a place of insecurity for them, honestly, like anybody that's got to go around doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's 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 inevitable no matter what you fucking put out, man. Mm-hmm. No matter what you put out. People make fun of fucking Jay-Z and fucking th- that guy's 
amazing, right? And he's yeah. so su- so successful. But it's like, you know, there's still motherfuckers that want to talk shit. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are or it, what you do. What they don't realize, too, is that when they talk shit, it usually starts, uh, um, it usually convinces the person to do something else that you're going to hate even more. Yeah. Like, the whole reason why Wicked Garden started writing, a, writing original music is because we got tired of people telling us we couldn't. Yeah. You know, like, oh, you're just in a cover band because you can't write. I'm like, you don't know my fucking history, dude. I've been putting out records for 20 years. You know, but that literally is what started. It was one guy, just uh, one guy too many got to me. And I'm like, well, we're going to start writing our own shit. And all we we're going to do is write one or two songs. And we did. And then we did a show at Vamped and somebody filmed it and they put it on Facebook and somebody in this record label saw it and then they said and then next thing you know it's like we started getting phone calls like within literally three weeks and it went from we're going to do one or two songs to hey we got you know people want an album's worth of material and within a year we had something signed and sealed and we were in the, in the studio and then we got shit for being an original band and i'm like you guys are never fucking satisfied but you caused it you created the monster yeah you know if you would have left us alone as a cover band we'd still be playing covers and you could still hate us we'd be fine but because of you and now i had to do this and now you're pissed off and jealous because i have a record deal and you don't so now go fuck yourself yeah you know so i don't understand you know you just gotta uh i I think the um the tactic like joe rogan takes to it which is where he just doesn't pay attention to the comics you say whatever you want i'm not going to interact with you on these things uh Mm -hmm. you know it's like uh that's for you guys to discuss that's not for for you to get involved with um and uh like i don't know people are going to just be douchebags you know absolutely they want to say the most fucked up thing they can possibly say or get the the oh from somebody you know (laughs) and it's like man you would never say that to my face right because absolutely not yeah. i'd knock you the fuck out because you deserve it you right. know because you don't talk to people that way mm-hmm. but you are all we're on the internet so you're gonna you're gonna say this fucking fucked up stuff and it's just uh it's not a uh it's not the way people are supposed to talk no, to each other no. man and keyboard warrior shit but you know back you know when we were younger you just wrote about people on the walls yeah you know, like oh froberg's a jerk off you know yeah. and that's the inter- that was the internet back that then. was that's they, exactly yeah. what it is isn't it yeah, absolutely that's what we used to do you it's know it's like a shit blasting on the bathroom wall absolutely on the fucking gym or something like that you just open hey for a good time call froberg's mom you know ah. it's like you know, now you just do it on on the internet i can fucking see it yeah <laughs> yeah it's kind of ridiculous man mm. it's kind of ridiculous but people want to hate man people like to hate you know, it gives I them, think it's, uh, yeah. It, it, gives, gives, it gives them reason to do, or actually, no, not even give them reason. It gives them excuses. Yeah. I can't do this because this person did that. And I'm like, really? That's the reason why you can't? You know, and I, I, we, you know, I've done things. Every, like, I've always told this to people. If you want to see me do something, tell me I can't. I will figure out a fucking way. Right you know? When I came to Vegas in 2009, I literally hadn't picked up a guitar in six years, you know? Um, I, you know, I wanted to see my kids grow up. So I moved to Vegas and I was working as a poker dealer and I used to go outside and, uh, in uh, carnival court at Harris, the crashes would play every single night and the crashes a fucking great band. They call the droids now, but they're a fucking awesome band. And I got to know those guys and Frankie Cazenza, you know, I was like, dude, you know, cause he, we got to talk and he was like, you, why don't you just do it? You know, like, just, just go play. I'm like, dude, I'm like, I don't know if I could, you know, I got kids. Well, but he goes, yeah, he goes, you, you'll find a way. And I remember going home and I told my ex-wife I was going to do this. She goes, you can't do this. She's like, no one knows who you are. And I was like, okay, well, now I have to show you. She wasn't saying it to be rude. She was saying it to be like, you know, you got to be realistic, you know? And okay. And then within, you know, six, seven months, I had a a local band that was playing. And we didn't do anything spectacular, but we played around for a while. And then that band broke up. I got to another band. And then, you know, it kind of went through there. And then I got to Wicked Garden. And then Wicked Garden started really clicking because I had made a lot of good connections because I was dependable and I'm not a dick like I like you know this is the most shit talking I'll do if you notice I don't use anybody's names you know I I can tell you I think you're a jerk off but if I don't say Joe's a jerk off it's gonna stay you know enough where people like maybe he's talking about the person maybe he's not I want I'm gonna leave it that way you know Um, but I also have no problem telling you a jerk off to your face if you fucking want to bring it up to me you know and I think that's why I kind of done what I've done and why the band's done what we've done because we've always just been that way, you know? Uh, just like I said, doing the fill-ins and helping people out. You know, they want to talk about us, but I was fine. God, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> that's the industry. is always going to be shit talkers, yeah, man. Yeah, that's it. Just go fuck yourself. Yeah, that's it. Yep. So, yeah, well, uh, you do have the new album, uh, Post 
Whoa, let me try that try again. again. Uh, <laughs> Post dystopian leisure music. There you go, yes. And uh, we got a video of one of these songs off of the uh, new album, uh, Ask Me If I Care. Maybe we can take a listen to that bad dude right here. Yeah, this is the fun one. We had a good time making this one. You guys are great, you hear me? You with the hair, love it. Thanks. And you, Shane. Sean. Okay, whatever. I love that thing you do with the guitar with those squiggly sounds. <laughs> and you, I love the way you bang those things. Brilliant. The drums? Whatever you call them. Yeah, those. And you, love that pirate look you got going on. Yo ho ho. <laughs> <laughs> look, you guys are dope, feel me? But if so, you want to be on big, the funny thing is the dude that's talking. Single. Something the honey yeah. really His father is J.R. Robinson, yeah. the fucking drummer. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, we got something. Like the most recorded drummer in history. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I hate this guy. <laughs> I like the little uh, cinematic in the beginning. Yeah, I had some fun with that. You know, my son uh, films all this stuff and edits it, so I kind of, you know, because I don't know how to do it. I can direct. I can tell people what to do. Yeah. So I tell them the shots I want, everything. Um, the only issue that we had is we were having camera issues this day. We had one day in the studio to do it, we had no budget. So if you notice, like, it's a little, like, shaky at times, like, uh, oh, a yeah. fuzzy at times. There's always something there. Yeah, and I'm like, I told my son, if you could do anything, fix it. Yeah. And we corrected it as much as we could. That's what it is, man. You know, like, uh, I thought we were just talking about this yesterday as well, where, uh, you know, as a director and a creator, you have a vision. Yeah. And you go for it as best you can, but budgetary limitations and time limitations, and you just, just you got the equipment you got, and, yeah. and you get what you get out of it, and uh, and that can either drive you nuts or you can be like, fuck yeah, man, right. look at this thing we ended up doing. Yeah, I mean, uh, this one, I mean, came up here. The other one for Already Gone, I thought came out great, and they were both shot with two Canon Rebel T6s. Yeah. You know, that's all we have. And, uh, you know, and my son goes home and pops into his fucking computer and edits it for us. Yeah. That's so cool. I like making videos. I actually enjoy We wanted to do two more for this record, but because of Corona, <laughs> we can't do it. Everything's shut down. Yeah, we, we have nowhere to do them at this point. Yeah. I love that. He's got another one underneath it. <laughs> nice. Cool to have like female friends in town, like my friend Christina there. Yeah. It's like, listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be in a video for my band. You have to basically act like like trashy, and we're gonna throw dollar bills at you. She's like, all right, I'm game. Like, sweet, thanks. <laughs> you shoot this at what? MDV? This was actually shot at Joey Grillo's place. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, we just rented it out for the day, and like you know, Joey just let us do what the hell we want. So he's fucking popcorn all over the floor. You had to shoot that thirty times. It's fine. See, that's what I need—a big old space like that, yeah. with a nice wooden floor. Well, that's the thing. I mean, we thought about doing it at MDV, but we just—I didn't like the visual all right, of it. All right, guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was good and all. But what it really needs like to a be right. is oh, a rapper. Right. Let me call my homie Lil Stain right now. I got to start. Oh! <laughs> yeah, it's something else we filmed like 30 times. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone attack him. Right. And it's funny, like the stuff that we didn't show, like the stuff that we, you know, that was edited out is like us like just stomping John. Like, like that poor dude, man. Like we so did. Great. He's such a good sport because, you know. But, like, we, we, we were throwing shit at him. We were kicking him. Had him in a headlock at one point. Like, it was, you know, it was fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Shooting music videos are always fun, man. I, I really enjoy like it. it. Yeah, it's, it's a good time. It is. And I think that people don't realize how important they still are. You know? I think, uh, I, like, I wish MTV would come back. And I don't mean that in the sense that I thought MTV was anything great. The concept of having visuals to music is so important these days. It's more important now than it was back then. Yeah. Because we're all visually based, you know? Um like people don't talk on the phone anymore. They they, they they talk on their phone and they you know they FaceTime and stuff like that. Everything's visual. When bands don't want like I remember our record label was like, Well, we want you guys to do lyric videos. I'm like, Well lyric videos are fine. I'm like, but it's not giving anybody anything. You know, we yeah. included the lyrics in the C D cover. So we were like, Well, what if we pay for a video? Like if you pay for the video, we'll put you know, we'll make sure it gets distributed. We're like, all right, so 
fucking videos cost me nothing. I, I took my son to fucking Olive Garden and gave him 50 bucks. Like, that's yeah. what my videos cost, you know? It costs more money to rent out Joey's studio. And, uh, but I wanted that visual representation of it. I wanted, it, you know, people to look at it and make a, a connection to it. You should do some, like... Oh, yeah. Yeah, you should... Me, 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 should, you should talk at one point when the next album comes out. Yeah. Get some videos done. That'll be fun. Oh, yeah. I would love to, man. Yeah. Uh, we did uh, We did some fun stuff with, like, the, the Cracker Man stuff. Yeah. And I have a lot of stuff did for you shooting do, live. Did you and... do the, the White Trash video uh, in the house? I or... uh, I assisted with getting the shots and, and everything like that. But, no, that was... Uh, fuck, what was his name? It was a different guy who yeah, ended up editing it all and, okay. and directing it. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, we used, we used some of my cameras and shit like that, but... It, they, we had a, a great director. I helped with some of the uh, other videos uh, mm-hmm. that we cut together, but then we could also send those out to uh, the same dude. He'd do a bunch of cool effects and shit, all, right, the, yeah. all the cool effects and stuff like that. I was all <laughs> uh, Tyler and, oh, fuck, I, I hate that I can't remember everybody's right. names. But, yeah, uh, that was all Tyler and the, and his, and the other uh, director of the, uh, mm-hmm. the music videos adding all the effects and shit in post. It was but yeah. it was fun going out and shooting them and making all the videos. Yeah, and I mean, editing them all together. They're annoying for a while. Like you know, like, like having to you know sing the same song for four and a half fucking hours. Like it's annoying. Yeah. But you know, the finished product sometimes is like wow. Like I, that's why we don't do like we haven't done a straight performance video yet. We're probably going. Well, we were going to. Um, but I made it like really clear when I when I. Because the, the, the label kind of wanted to know what we were doing. <laughs> like, listen, if you're going to make a video we're going to put out, we kind of want to get an idea. You're not going to be fucking a goat, you know, basically. Yeah. And I, you know, I sent them, like, the script and everything, and they were just like, oh, this is actually a pretty good idea. Can you pull it off with no budget and two cameras? Yeah, I can do this. You know, I, I, luckily I know people. And uh, I think they both came out. Like, that one came out pretty good. I think the first one came out really good. Um, and it was a good representation of the songs because when I did interviews afterwards, when people asked me about them, they had specific things they wanted to know. That tells me you actually watched it and, le- and listened. Yeah. You know, when you did this video, why did you show this? Why, you know, and, and that made me feel really good. That was like, okay, you were paying attention, and that was the whole point, you know. Um, you know, and, and some of them, they, like, the first video especially had a, uh, you know, there's like a, not a hidden message, but it's, there's an underlying theme. And when people got that, I was really happy. I was like, ah, oh, you figured it out. All right, good. That's what I was going for. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was cool. What was the first video called? Uh, Already Gone. Oh, Already Gone? Yeah. Nice. Let me see if I can look that up too, man. We got a few more minutes left to tape. Maybe we can roll that fucker at the end. Sure, what the hell? Man, we've been yapping for what, like eight hours now? We've already got uh, two hours almost on oh, this shit, thing. Oh, shit, I'm going. sorry, dude. Oh, why are you sorry? That's I fucking fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Nice. Oh, yeah. See, here, I got it right here. <laughs> I'll pull that fucker up. Yeah, and uh, so, yeah, you got uh, you got the new album coming out, Post Dystopian Leisure Music, right? You can find all your stuff on uh, wickedgardenlv.com and Wicked Garden LV on all your social media and the yep. Facebook and the Twitters and that stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and you got uh, we got this other new video going on. You got uh, Well, I guess uh, I was going to ask if you got anything coming up right the corona well, shut us all down yeah nothing i was just I mean, instinctively going to that I know. question right I, all i could say is all that you know the post dystopian leisure music is available on you know amazon and and record stores and stuff like that like in walmart and target but also you know spotify apple deezer title Napster. it's on all of them yeah know? and then once all this shit cools down we're gonna start you know, hopefully record the second album and have it out by early next year we'll see that's the plan. Nice. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Well, man, I really appreciate having you on the podcast. I appreciate it. Has this, been man. fantastic. Yeah, it was fun, man. It was yeah. Good, good time. Thanks. Anytime we talk for two hours, it's just great. Right. I, I, I'm sitting there like, part of me is sitting there going, man, I'm like, was yapping this poor motherfucker's ear off. And the other part of me is going, like, have we covered enough shit yet? And he's like, <laughs> oh, dude. It's fucking great, man. You know, it's, it's been a great conversation. Yep. I love it. And, uh, yeah, and uh, I like closing out the uh, music podcast with some music. And so here we go with uh, Wicked Gardens Already Gone. Oh, sweet. Are we still, like, live? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Hey everyone, thanks for watching my podcast. You can check out more podcasts right here and subscribe by clicking right here. We are a new podcast every Monday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time.